Amen. Wow, I'm so I'm glad so many people came. How many people were not here yesterday? Can I see your hand? Wow. And I always want to know how many people, this is the first time you've ever heard me speak. Can I see your hand? How many people don't really know who I am? Can I see your hand? <laughs> Help them, Jesus. <laughs> I'm serious about that, really. If you've never heard someone talk about the supernatural in extreme detail, or heaven in extreme detail, you get undone. And I can tell you right now, you will not figure it out in your natural mind. And if you try to do that, you're going to be in trouble. Because <laughs> the very first thing you hear, you'll still be trying to figure that one out. And I've already said 12 others. And I just say, open up your spirit because the things of God are discerned by your spirit. Your natural mind craves knowledge and information. But your spirit man craves revelation. It is fed by revelation, either through the word of God or by the spoken word of God. And he does it both ways. If, if you're from a group, excuse me, a group that doesn't understand that God still speaks today, well, you will after today. He's never stopped talking to his people. And he will always have people that will speak for him. And usually your spirit will witness that that is truth coming from that person. And I always tell people there's a couple things you can go by. Number one, if you can ahead of time, try to check the person out. Don't always go by Google. Uh, except this. If they're being blasted, if they're being accused of being a witch or a false prophet or a wizard, a warlock, or some other alien type thing, I promise you they're from God. Honestly, if they're, call, if they're accused of speaking for Satan or deceiving or lying because their message is so powerful, it terrifies hell. And I've already achieved that rank. And I count it all joy. Because Jesus experienced those very things. Don't ever let those words convince you. Because unfortunately, people are moved by everything. They'll be excited about things people say. Then the minute they see something come up, oh, man, no, forget them. Don't go there. They're weird. They're, they're, they're operating in witchcraft. There is no coven on the face of this earth that would allow me to join them. <laughs> Not a one. And trust me, they know who I am. There's not one demon that would want me in fellowship with them. It would do them great harm. They would have serious confusion and extreme pain. Because there is no darkness in me, they have no hold on me. They cannot use me, control me in any way. They're terrified of me. They know who I am because I belong to Jesus Christ. I've given my whole entire self to him. I have an intimate relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My eyes are open to the spirit realm so I can even see them. They can't hide from me. I know how they operate. I share it with you to help you live your life in victory. They don't like people like that, but they will certainly use every single person, weak-minded person, or person who belongs to the enemy who is willing to blast them. So if you see things, I mean, I'm right on there. There is a person right now saying that I am a false prophet, that Billy Graham is a false prophet, Kenneth Copeland is a false prophet. Now, hello, Billy Graham. <laughs> if I'm on the list with him, I have arrived. <laughs> and I wanted to thank the person for including me on the list. And I just really want you to be aware of that because everything is now put on the internet for you to choose what you want to believe. And if you check out the person's message and you feel the love of God, they're talking about living in holiness because there's a lot of people talking about the supernatural. They don't always include stop sinning. They include freely sin because there's grace. And this is the Holy Spirit's newest. Uh, he always gives me these little lines to share. I quote him all the time. This is his newest quote. Did God send his precious son to die and give you grace so you could freely sin? 
Or did he die and give you grace so you could be free from sin? Now, which one do you think he came for? Because they're both being put out there. I choose number two. He gave you grace so you could be free and live free from sin. But there is a message out there right now that says you have grace, sin all you want to. There's even a Christian college, I don't know which one it is, make sure you check them out, that is telling the students, sin any way you want to, grace will cover it all. It's really sad. You'll never hear that from me because I know the Father and I know that the blood of Christ will keep any sin, darkness or evil forever and all time out of heaven and eternity. And that's why he made that. That's why you have to receive that sacrifice. It wasn't to force people to go to hell. We need to stop thinking it in our own mindset and knowing what heaven's point of view is on everything. If you're going to live victorious in the days we're entering into, you have to know how heaven thinks and how they live. Because if you want his will done on earth as it is in heaven, you obviously have to know how they do it in heaven. Is that right? Say amen. amen. That's why he takes me and has been taking me for over 15 years and showing me heaven. So you will know how they live. Because in these days we're entering into, he calls it the kingdom age. He does not call it the perilous times. I'm sorry. It's not the tribulation days. Obama is not the antichrist. He is not smart enough to run our country. <laughs> Think about it. The antichrist will run the world. And he'll actually have real answers. But people are so hungry to escape. And yet, these are the greatest days God ordained for us to rule and reign. So, of course, the enemy has to do the best he can to put fear in God's people that you have no future. And, that, and he's doing a pretty good job. And actually, he doesn't even need the demons to spread the word because half the body is spreading it for him. If you go on YouTube or Facebook or wherever, half the people are saying doom and gloom and this is the end. And the other half is saying just the opposite. I'm on the other half. Because I happen to know God. I happen to know he has a timeline and we are not in the perilous times. And he said this to me personally. I would not allow the tribulation to come now because if it did, half the body would take the mark. Because they have so much fear and so much darkness in the world in them that they would be afraid I couldn't take care of them. And they would crumble. How many people agree? I don't know why people think that all prophecy has been fulfilled because I can quote five scriptures and none of them have come to pass. And these are things that either God said or Jesus said. How many people say they get to choose? Let's all say, if I raise my hand, everybody say it. They get to choose. This all belongs to them. We belong to them. So may his will be done and not ours. Now you just agree with heaven. You need to learn to do what they do in heaven. They declare what God says and they declare what he wants. That's how it gets established. And he gave us rulership of this earth. He didn't give it to the devil. And if you really knew how powerful the blood of Jesus Christ was, you would have no fear in you at all. There would be no fear. A manifested son or daughter has no fear. They have no lack. They have no darkness. But they're filled with the power and the love and the purposes of God. And that's where he wants us all to come to. I think the Holy Spirit has a big job, don't you? But there's something that hasn't happened yet that's going to help a lot. And that's the scripture that says, In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. It hasn't happened yet. Because when it does, we're going to look a whole lot different. I can even tell you what that is. It's the Holy Spirit bringing fire from heaven. We're about to get baptized in fire. 
And it's really funny where you not notice that everything is talking about doom and gloom. They're talking about asteroids, meteorites, other planets, fiery things. It's all about fire or destruction hitting the earth because it's coming, but it's coming from God. And it's not going to destroy anything but the darkness in you, the doubt and unbelief in you. That's what it's going to do. It's going to refine you and transform you. That's what the fire of God does. So the enemy always makes a copycat and puts it out there for fear. And yet you should not fear if you belong to the living God who made everything you see and all that you do not see because he has plans for you. If your loved ones have gone to heaven, have a party because that's what they're doing. And somebody actually emailed me and said, you know, I don't think it's kind of nice that they're up there having a party and a celebration and we're under, we're under destruction and fear and lack down here. And I went, oh, so when you go to heaven, do you want more of the same? <laughs> and when you go to heaven, would you like another funeral or would you like to have a party? I said, those people have finished their race. They have gone home to their reward and they are going to celebrate but they haven't forgotten about you. They're up there cheering you on, declaring over you. God is right now, since last resurrection morning, been enlightening every coast of North America with his host. Millions of angels have already been released from heaven and have lined the coast of our country. And yet people are running around going, oh, we all lost. Darkness is coming. Great destruction is coming. It's doom and gloom and fearless. Head to the hills. There's more for us than there are against us. Amen. And you cannot leave here the same. When you hear what God's plans are and he tells you who you really are because the enemy has been trying to deceive you all these years. Because he sure doesn't want you to know who you are and the authority that you carry and how to use the power the blood of Christ gave you. Because then he really is in trouble. But like every other time he tried to take over something, he really thinks he's won. And he really thinks he's got our country and half the body of Christ are just confirming what he's saying. I tell people all the time, stop helping advertise for hell. God offers you life and death, doesn't he? Is not this whole thing about light versus darkness? Then why are we helping to advertise the darkness? Do you belong to it? <laughs> I think some people know more about that, look more about the death and destruction and the darkness than they do about the glory and the power of God. They forgot who he was and who they belonged to, but don't worry, he's going to remind this world. I would be more concerned about being ready to do stuff for him than having it all in. He not letting us go anywhere until we finish the job that we were put on this earth to do, and that's to let this world know there really is a God. And when you follow Jesus Christ, you really do have power and authority over this earth. Amen? Amen. That was my introduction. Every time I see some new little thing they put out on Facebook or YouTube, some other, other thing, announcement of destruction or death and uh, doom, I'm like, I've had it. <laughs> and they'll list all the reasons why it's the end times, and I will comment. And they delete me as their friend. <laughs> I will list all the reasons scripturally why this is not the end. And they say, no, you're helping people. You're, you're going to make them go through the tribulation. And what you're saying, they're going to go through the tribulation. They won't be ready for the rapture. I'm like, number one, no matter when the rapture comes and you don't get to choose, if you belong to God, you're going. And if you go home now before the rapture, you don't even miss the rapture, people. You get your glorified body first. I personally would prefer a private entrance into heaven, thank you. Because if you go with the mass in the group, it's a little bit different. If you're already up there, you come in the clouds with them, you get your bodies first, and then they get it, amen? So nobody who's up there is going to miss the rapture experience. We need to look at heaven's point of view. See, that's how they see it. You come now, get your own personal welcome home celebration party. You get to bust through the second heaven and blow up things that belong to the enemy. 
and laugh all the way you're going through that place. But some people don't have a clue what I'm talking about. You're about to get spirit realm 101. You need to know, the body of Christ needs to know about the spirit realm. It belongs to God. It doesn't belong to the enemy, but he's been ruling it for years. It's all around us. Heaven is a spiritual world. Hell is a spiritual place. You're not going to see it with your human eyes. Amen. So thank you for coming tonight. I'm going to take a few questions. And we want to record them. And this is being live streamed, you said? Well, we just welcome the world and anybody watching. Oh, there's a question. Uh, by the way, I want you to know that we have Finland and India and Malaysia and Japan and New Zealand and Australia all watching us. And London, in Scotland, in Ireland, in Puerto Rico. Because my Facebook friends around the world are all watching this meeting. Sweden, South Africa, half of Africa. Hello. Oh, it's on. There you go. <laughs> Kat, my question for you. You mentioned that no darkness is allowed in heaven. So what is the Father's view on once saved, always saved? That's a very good question. I think that God is a lot more merciful when it comes to that than we are on this earth, just from listening to a lot of the body of Christ. When I was raised in, in a, a wonderful denomination that's done a lot for God on this earth, we were always taught if you had one drink of liquor or smoked one cigarette or danced one dance, you were going to hell. Uh, it's not quite that easy to go to hell once you're a believer. <laughs> However, it may help you die early. Not the dancing, but the other two things, okay? <laughs> I always encourage people to really take care of your temple. Because you're only going to last as long as you take care of this body. The enemy has all kinds of traps out there to get you sidetracked, steal your destiny, get you pulled into everything out there that he offers. But really, to lose your salvation, and I have to just tell you this, that you can because the word of God says you can. I don't say that because it's my own opinion. The word says, pray that your name not be blotted out. Now, that's in the word of God. No one can take it out. You can't take that out. Uh, you would have to get to a point where you despised God till he turned your back on the blood of Christ and gave your whole entire self to the devil. And this is it. People who are concerned they've lost it, they haven't lost it. I'll just give you a clue. If they cry and complain and whine on all the time, you know, I, I hate what I do. There is a difference in being caught in a bondage of something and you want to be free and you battle with it all the time and giving yourself to something. In other words, there's a big difference in selling drugs, making money, glad that you're actually destroying lives and you know you're destroying the lives and you love it that you're helping Satan than someone who's hooked on them. There's a difference. God wants you free no matter which one you are. But even Lucifer lost his right to be with God. If the angels can lose their right to be with God and be in his presence, how much greater do you think it is for us? If the enemy is able to deceive the very angels who live with God and they sinned and chose him instead and left what they were made for and they were all kicked out and can never repent. Now we're blessed. We can repent and repent and repent and repent and repent and repent and repent. God would rather you stay free and be a witness. Amen. But the word says, pray your name not be blotted out. There's also scripture to say, there may be many that come before me that say, he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. And he'll say, well, we won people. We help people get healed. We've, but you know what? Those are probably leaders who were sinning actively and don't care. Now, they're the worst example of the body of Christ as someone who's in the uh, position of an apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, and they're known, and yet they're sinning willingly, knowingly, and don't want to repent and think they don't have to repent. They are in big trouble because they cause others to fall because of the witness they're given, and if when they, their time comes to go, I, I would not want to be in their shoes.
because they're probably going to be some of the ones that he says, depart from me, I never knew you, because they may have said they accepted him, but their life does not show it. I'm just saying this, live a repentant life. If you sin, just repent quickly. Give yourself to God. Go before him and say, you really want to be free of things in your life so you can do something victorious for him. But we also need to stop beating people up with things like this. You know, someone's got a long-term sickness, and I hear this all the time, they must have sin in their life. That's pathetic. It's pathetic. You don't know. They may have had a serious call in their life, and the devil keeps beating them up and attacking them, and that may be the number one reason why that happens. Stand for them to be whole. You stand alongside them. Don't jab them and stab them and cast them down. Amen? God wants all of the people to be free, even the vilest sinner, which is hard for us to understand. But if you knew how much he loved us, you'd understand. I would just say, it's not worth it to step out of your salvation and play and give yourself to the world and the devil. And uh, the people who do that don't care. They just don't care. They have no intention of ever repenting. So it's hard to lose it, but the Bible says that you can. Amen? There's my answer. Thank you. And don't ever, don't ever be afraid of your children going to hell. God doesn't do that. Uh, this is for uh, the question about the body part warehouse. And uh, my question is, is I think you said in your book that God's going to like empty out the body parts warehouse and do the signs and wonders and miracles. Uh, is that only for people who have been given the gift of doing signs and wonders and miracles to, to bring those down out of heaven? Or can anyone who believes do, do that? And if so, how do we do that? How do we get it from the spirit realm into the natural to get people healed and made whole down here? I do know that he is going to, at one point during this time that we're in, empty the body parts warehouse. It's part of the miraculous that's going to happen. I don't know when that's going to happen, what day or when it's going to start. It will be masses at the same time it's like it's not going to be like here and there here and there it's not going to be like that god's going to make sure the world knows he's doing something spectacular and this is the time when god really wants to begin to use the body of christ and we all have the ability to pray for people and believe for people to be healed never stop believing even if you do it to the moment they die if you understood what you released in the atmosphere by releasing your faith you take the air and atmosphere away from the enemy every time we declare something in faith and keep that stand if you keep that stand trust me even if when they stepped out of their body they were made whole but he does have plans and i'm not the only one he's told that to many 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 prophets and even believers have heard him say that he's going to empty that body parts warehouse and there will come a time on the earth when there aren't any sick believers or handicapped believers and even he's going to do that to some of the people in the world as a testimony to them and not just do things like that there'll be times when people get born again and every tattoo on them that was marked by the enemy will be removed from them even some of the homosexuals when they give themselves to God he'll put all the body parts back on them that they had removed he meant supernatural he meant supernatural these are things that you've never seen before happen amen I just say, be prepared. Just, you know, don't ever, don't, uh, don't ever stop praying for people. If you're out there already pressing in, it's going to happen one time. You're just going to start flowing. And there will be a time when people come into the house of God because the manifest cloud, the glory cloud, will be in the house of God. Whoever comes in will leave whole. These are not my opinions. This is what he showed me would happen. Um, I have a something I'm confused about, and I'm hoping you can help clear it up. Um, there's been people that have had real experiences, from what I understood, with Jesus taking them to heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. And two of those people saw Michael and Michael Jackson in hell. So I was hoping you could help clear that up. I can. Okay. I can, and actually, if you just look at the word, you'd understand what's happening. Every time God starts doing something, the enemy, the enemy makes a copycat to bring confusion and fear and misunderstanding. And uh, he has always done that, and he always will do that. Things that God did, and he would try to make something and say that this is his or whatever, but he actually has a mock heaven and a mock hell. 
Oh, I don't know why people are confused. Because the enemy does have power. He is the prince and power of the air, the atmosphere. He has the ability to create things, not people. He can't create more demons, by the way. The fallen angels are the demons. No matter what people have told you, he has not raised up hordes of demons and created more. He does not have the ability to create life. He only destroys it. Those angels that fell with him were beautiful and glorious, but the more evil they became, their very features changed. So uh, uh, there, he has created a mock heaven and a mock hell because God is accelerating that, and he's going to keep accelerating it. At one point, he said, I will take the whole congregation at one time. And I always say, right now, we're ready. Say, we're ready. ready. I'm going to say that one day we're just all going to go. Because see, instead of taking one or two at a time, he's going to take, take groups of people. He's already caught up non-believers and shown them heaven. And when they came back, they got saved. But if you, if the thing is people don't, as in, it goes back to the spirit realm again, they don't understand what that is. There is the third heaven. It is beyond our known universe. It is a spiritual world. God's house is the world called heaven bigger than our galaxy. And it's beyond your human eyes to see it. But there's a space in between called the second heaven. It's not our sky. It's beyond our sky. It's still a spiritual realm, but it's where the enemy, and if you read the word, you would understand he has set up thrones in this spiritual second heaven because he can't really control the earth totally, not yet. For the tribulation, he gets seven years, and that's about it, God said. That's all he gets, by the way. We're supposed to rule and reign up until that time. Whoever's here, however they're a believer, we're supposed to have authority over this earth. The seven years is the only time the enemy gets to rule. So he has set up a place when God brought the ice age and he could no longer control the original earth where the dinosaurs were. Y'all staring at me. See, mankind has a 6,000 year lease. Didn't say anything about before that. There weren't cavemen, by the way. No cavemen who rolled stones around and tried to figure things out. There were only dinosaurs and those kind of things. I'll explain that later if I have time. Between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 are two different ages on this earth. In Genesis 1-2, he was putting the earth, taking it apart and putting it back together. Well, in heaven, you get to watch it when he actually made it. In this place he has in heaven, you go watch him in a hologram create everything. You see him make it the first time, how he made it, how different it was with the one landmass, how the landmass was split, how the ice age came, how it sat dormant for millions of years, and then he blew on it and melted it. And there's verse 2. Because there's water, sky, water, land. He wouldn't have made it like that. And then he put it back together and told everything to replenish the earth. Well, you can't re-anything unless it was there before. So this earth is millions of years old, but mankind from Adam, we have a 6,000-year lease. Amen. And so what was my question? Oh, oh, the mock heaven and mock hell. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, but it's still about the mock heaven and mock hell. That's how he does it. That's how the enemy does it. So the enemy set up in the heavens, the second heaven, his own realm. He actually has a castle. He has a museum, a trophy room. He has these disgusting, vile caves. It's nasty. It's horrible. The stench is unbelievable. And he actually is like a bubble around this earth. He was really dumb because he figured, I will block God and his people. But every time you worship him, you bust holes through that place. Why do you think he says, forsake not the gathering together of yourselves? Because when you worship corporately, it's like a ballistic missile. And whatever's in the way gets busted up. Now, he is not going to tell you that. He's not going to tell anybody that. But I happen to know I've been there and seen it. It's real. He has another place that looks beautiful. And he has kept it there for one reason only. To bring an illusion and a lie to people. He used to just catch people up to that place and they weren't sure where they were. He uses the weak-minded or those who haven't really made a total commitment. Some who have no discernment whatsoever. Because it wouldn't really be hard to tell if it was real or not. But there's also been people who have been taken to the same mock hell. And shown people in hell that had colored hair. And anyone who wore blue jeans. Guess y'all are going. I'm serious. This person just reported. Those experiences are real. That's why you can't convince them they didn't go. They had a real encounter, a spiritual encounter. But Satan can appear as an angel of light. He has demons that can take any 
Buddy's appearance on them, which is why God says, test the spirits. Seriously, these psychics and these uh, other people, bless their heart, are not calling up your dead grandmas and talking to them. Those are familiar spirits that belong to the enemy. They can, a familiar spirit, familiar, that's why it's called that, can make themselves appear as anybody, anything at all. And if you don't have a close, intimate relationship with the Lord or have an understanding of the spirit realm and know that the enemy does these things, you would automatically assume you had been to heaven. But they're never shown a great part of it. They're shown a little piece, and then they're shown exactly what he wants them to see, which would be counter to what the people who are seeing the true accounts of heaven. But someone just reported, I've been to hell. I was shown people that were in there, and they were in hell because they had colored hair and they wore blue jeans. Now, how many people don't want to receive that word? That's ridiculous, isn't it? That doesn't make you go to hell. But we don't know who received Jesus Christ, even as they were dying. If they cry out to him, they will be in heaven. And I will tell you this, he may have lived a disgusting, vile life. He was actually crying out on the inside the whole time he was hurting. He was one of those hurting people, Michael Jackson, on the face of the earth. He didn't like himself. He, he, he suffered a lot. And I know he did wrong, but he had millions of people standing for his salvation. I hope you were one of them. You know why I pray for those people? They make the best witnesses. And sometimes, get a clue, when they get born again, they're murdered. So they can never give that testimony. I happen to know Anna Nicole was one of those people. Playboy, girl. You may not be aware of her in Kansas, but <laughs> you were better off. But she's in heaven. And there'd be a lot of people who'd fight and fight and fight me against that. But she cried out to God two nights before she died. She had just lost her 17-year-old son. She just had a baby. And she knew she could no longer live that kind of life she was. Unfortunately, it's the life everybody remembers. And just to give you a clue of how people will attack you after you're dead and say things about you, there are people who are saying that Oral Roberts used to hold satanic rituals on the ORU campus. I don't think that's true. I got to see him go home to heaven. I got to see him meet Evelyn. I heard what she said to him. I know what he got is one of his gifts from her. And all that was confirmed by his family because I didn't have a clue what happened the day he died in the hospital. But I was there when he left, when Jesus came and picked him up in his own chariot. Amen? You cannot go by what is being said by other people. You have to let the Holy Spirit witness to you. And if you hear umpteen testimonies of people who know God, love God, and they're sharing truth, then the enemy is going to come and give you, and it's going to happen more and more. So there is a mock heaven, a mock hell. Amen. Number one, nobody calls Mary, Mother Mary in heaven. And just to give you a clue, I'll probably share that tomorrow. But on the cross, when Jesus looked at John and said, John, behold your mother. And he looked at Mary and said, you behold your son. He ended their relationship as mother and son. He wasn't just saying take care of her. It had something he had. He could not die as her son. He had to die as her savior. That's what revelation, that's revelation on the word right there. When the word is revealed by the father, it opens up your understanding. See, because she would be, would be worshiped as somebody better than us, holier than us. She is honored. He said she would be highly honored among women. She is honored in heaven, but people don't go up and call her mother Mary. She doesn't even go by that. She's called Mary. And I know that same girl said that she was called Mother Mary. And if you don't have an intimate relationship and you don't test those spirits, you know how you test the spirits? You ask it something. If something shows up and wants to take you somewhere, you say, are you the spirit from the most high God who sent his son Jesus to die on the cross? That's the test. That's what the word says. And guess what? It will leave if it's not from God. Amen. If it says, yes, I am, then you can trust him. She should have done that. And so should the lady who saw the people in hell with the jeans on. That would include three-fourths of the body of Christ going to hell because you're wearing jeans. And nobody knows the heart of anybody. I will tell you, Hitler's in hell. I saw him. 
case you wondered. Judas is in hell, in case you wondered. Amen? So what's the next question? This is why question and answers take so long, but do you like it? You learn a lot. All right, I have a question. It's just kind of a superficial one, but I'm curious. How do you actually look in heaven? I know you described, you know, you look younger, you look better, whatever. I was just curious as can you tell people's um, nationalities and how do you know? I know you recognize them probably from their essence of who they are, but let's say they had a really big nose and a really small chin and all of that. I mean, someone was talking to me and they're like, do you get a <laughs> full body makeover, you know. <laughs> full body makeover. You get heaven makeover, you know, whatever. I guess I'm just curious, like, how you actually look and can tell nationalities and things like that. Okay. And um, I didn't have a question about the tattoo, too. But oh, okay. I might throw it in for free. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I never considered having a tattoo, but I would like to know, like, what does it look exactly like and what does it say? So maybe I could get one if I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> You won't get one like God's going to put on you because I don't think we'll ever know what that is. You'll have to know. But people are looking at me like, what are you talking about? Read the word, people. When you go home to heaven, he tattoos you in your forehead and in the palm of your hand. The scripture says so. And guess what? What else is going to be put there? Say it out loud. The mark of the beast. Why do you think Satan picked those two exact same places? Because he wants what God has with us. And when you go home to heaven, you get the name of the city of your God. It says so in the word tattooed in your forehead, a visible permanent mark. And you get the name of your God in your palm of your hand. The same exact two places. By the way, it's not going to be number 666. And it is not the microchip. Forget it. I get more emails. Oh, my God. They're bringing the microchips. Going to put them in people. I said, well, they put them in dogs now. They're not scared. The animals are not shaking and quaking. It is not a microchip. It will be a permanent, visible mark that you can see with your eyes. It will have an electronic way to, to, to look at it, but it will be a, a, it'll be a mark. Don't worry about the chip. It's not the chip, okay? So that was the answer for free. Um, no, I got an answer about the other thing. You will know all of your family members and all of your friends. The word says you will be known as you were known, but you will look a whole lot better. You look fantastic in heaven because it's your spiritual body. This physical body dies. That's what gets resurrected on the day of the day, uh, the resurrection on the dead, right? The dead in Christ shall rise. That's your body. Your spirit does not stay in your body. If you agree with me, then let's go put you in a box and leave you there forever and see how you feel. You wouldn't like it. Say no. Well, if you were put in the casket and your spirit was still kept in there, your spirit would not go to sleep. Your spirit is awake all the time. It never dies. And you wouldn't like it because that spirit would know it was confined in that casket. When you die, it says to be, at, let's all say it, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If they argue with you, just give them that scripture and they can probably quote it themselves. You don't stay in your body. You have a spiritual body. You're not a little wispy thing that flows to the walls. You actually have an actual mansion and live a real life in heaven. Amen? But you look fantastic. Your hair looks gorgeous. Your face looks nice. All the men look wonderful. And there's no bald people in heaven. You don't have any bad hair days. <laughs> In case you wondered, yes, you can have beards and mustaches. I don't know. Angels have beards and mustaches. I'll give you that for free, too. They're, they're not all clean shaven, okay? And they don't all look like us either. So you'll be, you will look perfect all the time. And yes, you can still tell that people are from different uh, ethnic groups. Absolutely. This is a wonderful thing. Everybody understands everybody. And sometimes they speak from their mind if they want, if you're walking by, it's just not, it's what they do in heaven. You walk by and someone wants to say something, most of the time they will use their mouth. I know some people are caught up and they said that nobody talks with their mouth. Well, they went one time. If you go thousands of times, you realize they use both. You don't sing with your mind in heaven. You, you sing with your mouth. You eat food. You breathe the air. You have spiritual lungs. So, you know, it's, it's a lot like living here, but a whole lot better. Amen. But you're just going to look really good. I know I've seen people, there's no old people in heaven anywhere. You look like you're in your 20s. You don't look 33 because Jesus died at 33. 
That was his appointed time. You look like you're in your 20s. You look eternally beautiful. And your glorified body is going to look just as good. Amen? I just got water baptized again. I receive it. Amen. Hi, I'm Roy. I just, um, you've already answered probably quite a bit of this question, but just wondered how um, a revelation of heaven has affected uh, the way you pray, the way you ask God for things and stuff like that and um, uh, here on the earth. It's like, wh what advice would you give to us about how we would change the way we pray? I, I, I will say, number one, believe that he actually hears you. That is the number one most important thing is that he does love you and he does listen to you. <laughs> he, he does hear you he does and no matter what level you are at because we're all at different levels um, if it's just brand new baby Christian don't know what you're saying maybe even cuss a little bit still haven't got that cleaned up but you know he will hear you he will hear you and he loves you he doesn't always answer it the way you expect him to and just because he hasn't answered it doesn't mean no Sometimes it's not his time. I will tell you this, you need, no matter how you're feeling on the inside, you need to declare it like you mean it. And the second thing is, de de declaration is still prayer. You always have times that you will intercede that's different in intercession, and God shares with you to pray about something. Somebody calls you and said, please pray about this. You, you can do an effectual, fervent prayer for them. Sometimes it's easier to pray for everyone else than, us, than ourselves. It's just true. You can believe almost for anyone else, but not you. You need to know that you're just as important to God as everyone else. But we need to learn to declare the things of God, what he has said about you in the word. I, I stand every morning, and by the way, it might be a good idea to recognize him every morning, because I do, and I have for years and years and years. And it changed me in the way that I... I know now that they're different. They have different personalities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They operate in different ways. Sometimes they're inside of each other when they do things. I've learned a lot. It's made me love them more, but as far as my authority, I had been operating in that for 20 years before he ever started. This wasn't just an overnight thing. I, I had pursued him all of my life. I still made mistakes, but I would spend four hours a night. I know everybody can't do that, but I only sleep four hours a day. And I just began, my father had found them. My dad pursued them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, from the age of eight, and he caught them. And I saw in his life, what does that mean? That means you begin to have his thoughts and his ways, that you love everybody. You don't judge. You pray for people. You know and understand things because God speaks to you. I saw my dad my whole life. I wanted the same thing he had, so I started pursuing him. I already knew that I had authority and was operating, and it has definitely increased since he is more and more showing me how the enemy operates, and I'm aware of what things enter into your life and what it does to you if you allow that. It's definitely made me make a stronger stand against darkness in my life, but as far as the intimacy... I had that. It's one of the reasons why they trust me, but you can have the same thing. And I'm going to throw this in for free. If you want to learn how to increase the intimacy, what do you do when you meet somebody you want to know them more? You don't tell them all your problems. <laughs> you can have a time of day you do that, but set aside a time where you're just going to sit alone somewhere and talk to Jesus like I am. And you say, I want you to know how much I love you. You know what you're telling him? He really is alive. He really is, because I am so grateful for what you did for me. I want to be more like you. I know I'm not there yet, but please help me. When people look at me, I want them to see you. When they hear me, I want them to hear you. I want them to know how powerful the blood of Christ is and how much authority we really have in this earth. The body of Christ, I declare they're going to wake up and know their God. Now, anybody can say those words. If you don't know what I'm talking about, being hungry, look up and say, God, make me hungry. I don't even know what that is, but I want it. You got to start somewhere. You don't have to wait till you're perfect. You don't have to wait till you know the whole entire Bible. Please read the book of James, though. So you can change the way you talk. Our number one enemy is not the devil. It's our tongue. 
I stopped saying bad things about me a long time ago. I stopped saying bad things about my family a long time ago. Don't help the enemy advertise everything wrong they're doing. You're just approving and you're just confirming to him he's doing it. You say the opposite. I declare my family members are going to be mighty children of God. They're going to be free in Jesus' name. They will not miss their destiny. They'll become the living testimony of the saving power of Jesus Christ. And what you have just done is you have sent the Holy Spirit after them. And you're letting the devil know, I'm not saying the other words anymore. I just spoke life. Did you feel it? The enemy can have no part of me. You know why? There's no darkness in me. I on purpose keep it out and choose the God things and the right things. We're supposed to be examples on this earth of Christ. I don't blast people because they're not at the same level. And don't do that, please. Just pray for them and love them. Like God says, love them, up, love them enough to let them die. What do you mean? Die to yourself. Because the, the glorious church without spot or wrinkle, the wrinkle is your flesh. I think we're, we're going to get there, amen? The, the spot is no sin. I'm coming for a glorious church with no sin and no opinions, attitudes, and rights showing up. No flesh showing up. That's what it will look like. Amen? So I would just, in, 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 I'm serious, set aside five minutes, start with five minutes and get in a room, play some awesome, awesome, powerful worship music and soak in it for about the first few minutes and then just start saying and tell Jesus how much you love him and how grateful you are. You know what's going to happen to you? His presence is going to come in that room and it's going to change you and give you such a hunger. You want to do 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you're going to look for an hour to do it. And if he ever shows up in person, you're, you're stuck forever. <laughs> you're stuck forever. It happened to me. And so I already knew him. He, he came and asked me. He came, actually did come and say, we're going to start taking you on tours of heaven. And I simply didn't say no. And I didn't even know why he was doing it. I didn't care. I just was glad I was going and seeing things and didn't ever share it with anybody until he came in years later, except the person he wanted me to tell. And he asked me to do this, so that's why I did it. Amen? You can have as much of him as you want. I'm not sure. I got two questions, but one's from another friend and my own question. Do we go through the tribulation? And then the second question, can you go in more depth about the Trinity? Because I was once asked, how could Jesus be on earth? God's up there and the Holy Spirit's over here. How could be Jesus pray to himself? Well, number one, the Trinity, of course, they're omnipotent and omnipresent. That means they do have the ability to be everywhere all at the same time. And you're never going to get much explanation on that. There's a big difference in them being God and we're not. Amen? But I will tell you this. I don't really know a whole lot about the tribulation. But if anyone is there as a member of the body of Christ, whether it was before, after, or during, I personally don't care because I won't be there. And neither will you. And you should say amen to that. You will not be here during the tribulation time. It's years down the road. Amen? And I know your mind is flying to Mark 13, which is part of my message. What's Mark 13? I bet you, how many people know what that says? It's the lesson of the fig tree. When he said, Jesus said, and the disciples, disciples were saying, you need to go read Mark 13. Okay, that's a homework lesson. <laughs> a homework lesson. Everybody says that when the fig tree begins to bloom and blossom and all that, they say that's talking about when Israel became a nation, but that is not what it means. It's talking about the kingdom age being established on this earth. It is not talking about Israel becoming a nation. And nobody said that before 1948. What is that? In 1948, there was a battle, and Israel was established as a nation, and they had their headquarters as Israel. And so they have been that, called that, since 1948. When that happened, people went into the scriptures and said, oh, that's what it's talking about, that when this, this generation shall not pass, see these things happen until all of this has been fulfilled. And that's talking about the perilous times, the tribulation, and the coming of the Son of God, the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, that generation that sees that happen, the budding of the fig tree, 
then, that, then uh, everything else will happen before that whole time on this earth ends. That's not talking about the nation of Israel becoming a nation because a lot of those people have already died. And that's why so many people are saying, yes, he's coming, he's coming right now because the time is running short and Israel's been a nation for a long time. God never said that's what that meant. He, he has told me what it means. When you, when you see the shoots come forth on the fig tree, and you see the leaves begin to appear and then the buds come get excited number one if he was talking about the perilous times he wouldn't say get excited hello also in the beginning of mark 13 when the God, when the disciples say uh tell us when all this is going to happen this is what he said there'll be wars and rumors of wars but don't worry those things have to happen, but the end is not yet. That's the time we're in right now. We're still in that time. When people are saying there's wars and rumors of wars, and he's saying, don't worry, the end is not yet. Too many things else have to happen. Amen? But what he's talking about is when you see the shoots come forth and the leaves come on the tree, that's the kingdom age being established on this earth. What does that mean? That means the body of Christ is actually going to live and act like they do in heaven. And you can reconnect it back to Matthew, where he asked, Jesus said, pray this way. He wasn't saying that for just to say a prayer. He was saying that because you were going to be calling in the kingdom of God being established on the earth. I'm not talking about the millennial reign. The body of Christ have to manifest on this earth and show off God's power and passion to the world. We have to do that. Or the harvest isn't coming in because the harvest isn't coming in from fear. The harvest isn't coming in because great destruction is on the earth. That's not why they'll come in. It's from the manifested sons and daughters of God, showing God his power and his love to this world. And that's why the people are going to want him because the word says they will know us by our love for each other. So nobody here is going through the tribulation, but our life is important and our race is important because we will establish a level on the earth that's never been set before by the body. So those coming after us will walk on it, follow after it. So by the time the perilous times come, we would have already built places of haven and safety for those who will be here during that time. It's important for God to have this time. He talks about all of the word, but nobody knows what he's saying. So the fig tree's talking about that. And the next thing he says is when the buds begin to appear, get excited. Because that's the fruit. You know what fruit is in your life? Not talking about figs. He's talking about learn the lesson. The shoots come, the leaves come, and then the fruit comes. And then there's a long, he says, be excited because summer is near. That means the fruit will begin to come on the body of Christ. It'll ripen. And what's at the end of all the summer? It's the... Duh. That's the great harvest. And it isn't coming till all that stuff happens first. Say amen. amen. Does that clear up some things in your mind? That's what revelation does. Amen. We're calling it in. Our Father who is in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come. What is that? His will being done on earth as it is in heaven. And he's revealing heaven so you know how to do it. Say amen. amen. Okay, who's next? Um, I'm Zach. I was just wondering, um, do you have like a free will in heaven, like on earth? And my other question was, like your mansion, can it be like made out of anything you want? <laughs> Those are two questions. The second one is really exciting. Because <laughs> I can tell you what, I have seen every kind of mansion you would imagine in heaven. Every kind built in every area, every place, every way made of all kinds of things. But the first one is, you never lose your free will. But once, you, uh, once you're in heaven, you're never going to sin again. You're only, you are so consumed and you live in love, in the passion and the power of God. There will be nothing in you anywhere that ever desires to do wrong. But you do get to make choices, of course. You get to choose where you're going to go, what you want to do. Uh, your soul, from the time you brought your soul alive which is when he made Adam, and he became a living soul. That's another whole message. You do get to choose places you want to go and things you want to do, absolutely. And your mansion will be everything you ever dreamed and so much more because it'll be supernatural. I've seen them built under the Crystal Sea, the aqua mansions, where you jump through a portal and you swim with the dolphins and the whales, and when you jump back in, you're dry. 
I've seen sky mansions build up into the skies of heaven where you walk in a column and say what floor you want and it zips you up there and you have a little star cruiser to go around heaven on. I've seen them built in these massive trees in this place that looks like the rainforest and the trees and the branches go in and out. You don't even have a roof on it because you like all of the outdoors to come in and they do. Uh, I've seen every kind of mansion possible. And they have other fun places besides your mansions like Jello Land where you go visit and jump in the Jello houses or eat them where they have the chocolate waterfalls that you can dive down in and swim in if you want to, where they have the amusement park where you learn to fly like Superman and Christopher Reeves teaches you. <laughs> it was his gift. They have roller coasters that leap off of the track and go across the sky to another part of the track. They don't know what fun is down here. And it's fun because God said you have to be like a little child to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And no matter how old you are, and if you think that's not true, you will enjoy every bit of it when you get there. I won't have to try to convince you. When you get there, you'll see it yourself. There's a lot of people who are real happy and excited, especially young people, to find out it's not boring. And if you're five years old and over and you die and go to heaven, you get your own hoverboard. And whole groups of these little kids fly all over heaven by themselves and do fun things. If you, if you had a child that's living in heaven right now, they're having more fun than you ever dreamed of. Amen? And God will keep them young so you can finish raising them when you get there. Oh, thank you, honey. <laughs> okay, you talked about third heaven revelation. And I had a prophecy once that said I had that. I don't really know very much about it. I didn't know if you have a teaching on it, if you could touch on it briefly, or just what it is. Uh, if he has told you that you're going to have a third heaven revelation, then you're probably going to know a lot about heaven. Uh, just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to. And I can tell you, once we have entered in, we're in a whole new fullness of time. Last resurrection morning... Um, and I don't care if you call it Easter or Resurrection Morning. I've just begun to do that. Last Resurrection Morning, I was in the middle of Kansas, um, in the middle of the USA, declaring for God that a fullness of time had come. And we were actually in a new time. We'd been on the threshold of it, but we actually stepped off the threshold. And in God's word, when a fullness time of time has come, he does something. And when he does something new, he always lets somebody tell you about it. He's always done that. He did that, he did that with Noah. He did that with John the Baptist. He did that with the Apostle Paul. Every time God was going to do something new, he had a messenger to tell you, we're in, you're in a new time. These things are going to start happening. And so, so many people are going to have understanding of the, of the third heaven. That's God's heaven. Uh, that's where God lives. That's where his house, the world called heaven is. And he's going to catch many people up there and show them things. He's going to give many people revelation for the same reason he gives it to me, to share it with other people. Because the more we know, the more we know who we are, and that's why he gives it. Because if we're made in their image, uh, if you don't know what that image and that likeness is, you don't really know who you are. And I didn't answer the rest of somebody's question um, about the Trinity. They have the ability to step inside of each other and be one. That's what the, that's what the, that's what it is. The three in one is they actually, you remember now they're supernatural beings, okay? They don't, they don't have except for Jesus. Jesus has a body like us now. Before he had that body though, he didn't even look like Jesus. I'm blowing some mindsets. His name was the word. Before he came to earth and died as God's son, he was called the word. That was his name. Read the book of John. In John 1, 1, the Word was with God. That's somebody different that's showing you right there. Two different people. The Word, capitalized, was with God and was God. And there wasn't anything that wasn't made that he did not make because he operated with the Father. Okay? So there is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before, it was the Father, there was the Word, and there was Holy Spirit. Some of the angels still call him the Word. Why was he called that? That's what he did. God spoke and he performed whatever God said. He made it. Actually, when he made Adam, the word and God were there together. The word formed when God spoke. The word formed Adam's body, who he later 
if you go back and read the rest of John, it says the word became flesh and came here and dwelt among us. That was Jesus. He was the word, but now he was Jesus, the son of God. And they didn't know him, and yet he made them. See, that's how he can say that. How can you say Jesus made us? Because the word performed what God said. And then when the word made Adam's body, God who was there leaned over and breathed Adam's spirit of life from himself into that body. So many times they would go together and do things together. And that's why Jesus said, I'm in you and you're in me. Well, he says that all the time. But when you go home to heaven, and he was caught me up to heaven one time, and the Holy Spirit is in heaven, he's on the earth, he's in outer space, he's in you and I, he's everywhere all at the same time. And I can tell you why, because he has layers. It's what God showed me. God is the spirit. Your body is made body, soul, and spirit. Each one of those parts is made after Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. That's why you have three parts. Not saying that's what they are. It's the appearance and the likeness. The likeness is how they operate. Let us make man in our image. That's an appearance. And let us get, and after our likeness, that's how they operate. Your body represents Jesus. That's God come in the flesh. You're his arms, his legs, his voice in this earth. The Father is spirit. Your spirit is made like the Father's spirit. Your spiritual body, God has a spiritual body. He has a head, arms, and legs, or you wouldn't have them. That's why you have a spiritual body. And that's why from the Father, the heart of his spirit flows the river of life. And the heart of your spirit is right here, just like God has. You're not God, but you're made like him. Your spirit's made like his spirit. And out of your belly flows rivers of living water. That's just like God, isn't it? That's his likeness. The river of life flows from him. Well, out of you, when you speak the right things and really live right, the rivers of living water flow from the heart of your spirit, just like God's, the river of life. So your spirit is made like God's spirit. That leaves only one thing left for your soul, which might shock you. It's one of the most important messages God gave me. The Holy Spirit is a layered being. He has unlimited layers of himself. And wherever he sends a layer of him, it's a whole of him. Y'all look like deer in headlights. This is, this is going to explain to you how the Holy Spirit can be everywhere all at the same time. A layer of the Holy Spirit is a whole of him. It's not a part because he is God, because he is supernatural. Wherever he chooses to send a layer of himself, it's a whole of him, and he knows everything wherever that layer went. And he has unlimited layers. Wherever he sends them, he knows everything where he sent that. That's what's so important about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, because when you receive that, he sends a layer of himself to fill you, the infilling and indwelling, he comes and dwells in you with a layer of himself, you get a hold of him, and you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? So your soul has layers, and whatever you give yourself to, you give a layer of your soul to that thing. And whenever you give it to, you get a deposit of that thing in your soul. And whenever you let get put in your soul by your choices, your will, in case you didn't know this, your soul is your mind, that's how you think, your will, how you make your choices, and your emotions, that's your soul. So it makes sense that whatever you allow in there is going to affect what? How you think, the choices you make, and the emotions you display. It is one of the biggest messages God has for the body of Christ. You need to be accountable for your soul. Your soul can be vexed. It can be sick. It can be whole. It can be cleansed. It can be joyous. It can praise God. Oh, my soul. And all that is within me, that person obviously had good stuff in their soul. <laughs> praise your holy name. And one of the things God is showing is you need to be careful of the choices you make because you make deposits. Why did God do that? Because when you give yourself to Jesus Christ, you gave yourself to him, he gets a layer of your soul and it is seated in heavenly places with him. Amen. Say amen. amen. That was another revelation on the word. You're, a layer of your soul, if it stood right here, would look like you, but it's a transparent image. It's a representation of you, but it's still a piece of you. And when you give yourself to Jesus, it's taken and is seated in heavenly places. When you give yourself to Jesus, he puts a deposit of the anointing in you. 1 John 2.27 says that. 
It's deposited in your soul. Your soul is to be filled with light and love and the word of God. He made you that way because the more you have in there, it will affect the way you think, the choices you make, and the emotions you display. How many people get that? Amen? What goes in your soul is going to affect the way you think, the decisions you make, and the emotions you display. And God is showing me what, your, what a human soul actually looks like. If you opened up an air filter, it's like layers like this. If these were all pages. It would be each one of those pages would be a layer, a, a transparent image of you. And some people have more, and that's why they're more expressive. Because they also display your emotions. Amen? Does that make sense? Some ethnic groups have more layers than others. I think the Scottish have five. Sorry, honey. You know, some people show more emotion and others show a lot, right? That's true. And then God says, some people are just made different. That's probably some of you. Amen? Amen. Okay, one more question. Um, when you go on these tours of heaven, how does the heavenly concept of time mesh with this concept of time? I mean, like, how long are you, like, gone? Oh, I understand. And then what happens with your body here when you're on the tours in heaven? Um, the Holy Spirit keeps it alive. Obviously, if your spirit's not in your body, your body's going to be dead normally because that's what he meant when you die to be, uh, you know, to be absent from this body is to be present with him. That's when you die. That's what he means. Um, he catches me up when he feels like it. I don't even know most of the time when he's going to do it. My husband is a witness right here for me that if he comes in the room and I don't respond to him, I'm just staring, he knows I'm not here. <laughs> and he, because he's Scottish, who's not moved by anything, will say, I'll come back later. <laughs> I didn't hear him say that. I have no awareness whatsoever because I'm actually in heaven, in my spiritual body. I walk on the ground. I smell the flowers. I hear them singing. I see the faces that they have. I've eaten the food. I've walked through mansions. But the people up there, the redeemed, never see me. The angels see me. But the people who are there never see me, and that's to protect me. Because I go so much, they'd be chasing me down. When you go back to earth, please find my mother, my sister, my brother, you know, my, my nephew, my niece, my pet, and tell them I still love them. Because you all do the same thing to me. I know you say you can't, but when you go again, would you find my mother, my brother, my sister, my father? Would you please find them? This is their name. This is what they look like. And I go, I can't do that. <laughs> they don't see me because they'd be doing the same thing. Amen. So to me, I have no awareness. My spirit has been taken out of my body and it's instant. I know what a blink of an eye is. It's like instant. It's like you were sitting there and the next instant you were somewhere else in the world, like Philip used to do all the time. Um, I don't generate that or cause that to happen. I don't just go to heaven. I am commissioned by the Father to be taken to heaven and shown heaven so I can reveal it. And I know Daniel couldn't reveal everything because it wasn't for that time, but it's for this time. John saw things he wouldn't want to mention. Uh, not John, but Paul. When Paul said, I knew a man, that was himself. When I knew a man who was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. He just told on himself. If you're in your body and you go to heaven, you're going to get weak. Your flesh cannot handle the glory. That's why you get drunk in the glory. It affects your body. In your spiritual body, it would be as normal as being here, except it's never nothing's normal in heaven. You're filled with his life and joy. and There's no conception of time. Down here, it's usually seconds. It's been seconds. Sometimes it's been a minutes, but it could be three seconds. You wouldn't even know I had gone if I stood here like this and then moved, I could have been all over heaven because there's no time. In the grocery store, in the parking lot, sitting on the front row waiting to speak, I've been caught up. Amen? And I don't know. It's, you know I still definitely want to share it with the, the soul. What do you think? I don't want to keep you all here too late. I know that there's church tomorrow. It's okay. I might take one more then. Something that hasn't been asked already. Uh, my grandson wanted me to ask this. this. He's 11. He wants to know all about the dinosaurs. He's being taught in science class 
that of course they were destroyed by an asteroid coming down on Earth. But he wants to know, are they in heaven? Can you play with them? Can you take <laughs> rides on them? Can you slide down their tail? Yes. Are they like a big slippery slide? And you know, all that stuff. See, I'm so glad I got a kid's question. It is a whole lot more fun than all the rest of them. <laughs> Absolutely yes, except they weren't destroyed by an asteroid. That's not how um, the land mass was split. You, there's places, literal, I have been to literal places in heaven, not just seen things, but taken into different buildings and places and areas in heaven and gotten a lot of detail. There's a place called Creation Lab and uh, somebody totally misunderstood what I said or somebody tried to explain it to them and they misunderstood it. And they thought I was saying that God had a Creation Lab where he had to go in and practice before he made anything. <laughs> that is not what I said. Please find out for yourself, instead of letting other people tell you, tell them to go to YouTube and put my name in and they will hear it. Patricia King interviewed me, I talked about that. There's like hundreds of things now on, on YouTube, uh, or just Google it, but you Google it, you're gonna get the junk too, false prophet. I think it used to be way at the end, now they've got it like number three, because I think not many people look at it. So they've moved that up. By the way, the leading psychic in America, Sandra Brown, made statements about me. And they weren't even mean. <laughs> she can't say nothing mean about me because I'm not mean or hateful. She said, I had this wild, fantastic, adventurous trip to heaven. That's going to make every new age person go and look at my site. And the Holy Spirit said, all it's going to do is it's going to help advertise for you. Amen. But you go to Creation Lab, one of the things he reasons he calls that there is you actually get to invent things when you get to heaven. Isn't that exciting? You will not stop inventing. It's even better up there. But there's a place you go into, this huge room, and you stand in a pedestal platform, takes you up, and all around you is this hologram. I'm not going to tell the whole story. It's a hologram, but the things are so real, you can touch them. And you see nothing. Then you see God appear and speak. And then you see the planets being made, the galaxies being made. You actually watch him make planet Earth as he holds it in his hand. It had one landmass. He filled one palm of his hand and poured it on the Earth, and that was the ocean. It was one ocean around one landmass. One palm. Now you think about that. One palm of his hand made the ocean for the whole Earth. And actually, he just made it special. I'm going to jump around, but you can go on there and just uh, look on uh, Google or YouTube and say Cat Kerr, comma, Creation Lab, and it'll probably bring that video up. It's, uh, I think it's in book two. I'm not sure. But, um, and I do have DVDs and CDs out there with stuff on it. But you literally see him make this beautiful earth, and the, and the flowers are 20 feet tall. The trees are massive. Small dinosaurs could stand underneath the flowers. And he made something different because our atmosphere, he didn't make the sun yet. The sun wasn't made. He lit the original earth with his glory because he's God. The new earth, it'll say there'll be no sun. It'll be lit with his glory. See, he's going to do it again when he remakes the earth or does it over or makes a new one. I don't care, by the way. I don't know what it is. I just know it's going to be massive, the new one. But he made the earth with a water vapor shield way up in the sky. And this, it was like a bubble, billions of gallons of water. It took two hands. He filled the bubble. And it stayed in another bubble, and it had a continual Mr. Shower come through the atmosphere because dinosaurs cannot live out of water. I laugh when I see they use the White Sands Desert to show the dinosaurs fighting. That's a joke. I'm from Florida. We have gators for pets. If you have a piece of water on your land, you got a gator. That's why they're in the water, because if they're trapped outside the water for like just a few days, hunks of their skin fall off. You can imagine a 90 or 100 foot dinosaur, what kind of atmosphere he had to have for them to live in. If you were a human on the earth at that time, you would have breathed water into your lungs. So it was made different. He had to make it different. And that was millions of years ago in the beginning. That was in Genesis 1-1. He made the heavens and the earth. He had not made the sun and the moon yet. Not at all. Hadn't made it because that's after verse 2, right? That's why people get confused, but there's a gap. He made the earth, put all kinds of dinosaurs on it, really cool ones, some we haven't even discovered yet. At, they didn't even kill each other in the beginning. There was no evil or crime on the earth. There was no hate. They got along really good. And, uh, and God put watcher angels on the earth 
to care for them. This is another clue to you. These, this tribe of angels was made different because they actually had flesh on them. Melchizedek was not anybody who was lived on this earth. He was not, he was not um, Abel. He was not Shem, right? Or Shep? I can't remember which one it is. Was it who? Shem. I keep calling him one of the three stooges. That's not really nice. <laughs> However, 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 I had seven brothers, and I know they acted just like that when they were together. And I can imagine what it was like on the ark with those three guys on that ark together. I'm glad I wasn't there. I was raised in the same house with that many boys, and I know what they did. They all act like the three stooges, okay? It was not a human being. Melchizedek had no father, no mother, no beginning, no end. He wasn't anybody. He was God's personal high priest. He sent to the earth, and he had flesh on him, but he was still a spiritual being. God sent him here to represent him. That's why he was here. When God made Melchizedek, who's always served at God's altars in heaven, he made a tribe like him as watcher angels. No, I've never read the book of Enoch. Everybody keeps asking me that. I haven't read it. I've read the Bible. Okay, but these angels were some of the ones who fell and created offspring. Now, do you get that? Say amen. amen. Because they created offspring. So these angels were sent to be watchers of the dinosaurs. That's why they find a dinosaur print, and they think it's a human footprint, but it's not. It's the angel. Amen? Anyway, what happened was when Satan was cast out of heaven, he began to make the earth a wilderness. The dinosaurs became evil, killing each other, got sick of it. He broke the water vapor shield. Billions of gallons of water hit the earth, split the land masses. They lap over whole herds of dinosaurs. And then when the earth was filled with the water, he blew on it and froze it. And there's the ice age. Say, God, God. his revelation, revelation. Is, simple. is simple. That was simple. And yet, all the scientists know that on the original earth, the sky was peachy color. And it's because of the mist coming down and the glory came from the earth. It didn't come from the sky. It was not blue like it is not because the sun is out there. And all of them agree with me. Amen? So it wasn't an asteroid. They're still looking for the asteroid. They'll never find it. Yes, there's dinosaurs in heaven. You can have them as pets. They have a place called Dinosaur Park. And you see all the dinosaurs there. None of them are wild. God made them. The enemy didn't make them. Amen? So stand up for just a minute. We're going to thank God for revelation that I'm going to share for a few minutes, and then we're going to do something. <laughs> He's getting brownie points. <laughs> Let's look up and say, Father, Father thank, you for revelation. thank you for revelation. I love revelation. It explains many things. Thank you for treating me like a child and making it so simple. But now you made me hungry for more. So just give it to me. Amen. You can sit down. I always thank him when he gives me something. But the, but the whole thing... Ever since he got, uh, ever since Lucifer wanted to overthrow heaven, and he never said he kicked God off the throne. He said he would exalt his throne above God. He really thought he could control him because he wanted what God had. And that's why all the stuff's going on in the earth right now. He still wants what God had. He wants the world to control, the people to control, and they can only exist the way he says to exist. And that's why he's doing all this stuff. And the one world government, that's all it is. Why did the enemy plan to do it that way? He wants one world, one people. They have one governor. That would be him through the Antichrist. And you can only exist through the mark of the beast. That's his way. And that's what we have with God. We live with God. He was our only world. Our own. We had our very existence in him. Uh, we can only live with him. We couldn't live somewhere out in heaven. And the enemy was there. He knew we were special and different. He knew that he didn't know what we were, but he knew we were special and different. He didn't want us to ever manifest into anything because he knew we belonged to God. You were little spirits of light. 
for those of you who don't know that, say, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of Lights. That was you before you were born. You're a little spirit of light. And you played inside God. Inside God are not human body parts. Inside God is eternity. He didn't exist or just appear somewhere in eternity. Everything came from him. And if you could look inside of him, you'd see no back. You'd see no sides. You'd see no top, no bottom. There would be no, there would be no dimension inside of him. You see this beautiful river flowing in him, going over these stones of fire. I don't know many places where fire can burn underwater. Say, our God is a consuming fire. He really has fire. It's his passion. It burns inside of him for you. That's why they see fire coming from him. When he sits on the throne, they see fire. The lightning are a million megawatts of his love. And yet the enemy likes to use that symbol as his own. There's a lot of symbols the enemy likes to take and use as his own, like the rainbow. That's the glory that comes from God in waves. It doesn't just sit there. I've never seen the top of that rainbow because it, it disappears into the glory. There's a huge glory cloud over God, and these angels will come down out of that cloud. They have fire burning out of the top of their head. They're the seraphim, and they're very beautiful. They'll come down back to angels. I've seen the feminine and the masculine appearance. That's what I call them. Some are absolutely beautiful. They look very beautiful, very feminine. They have very beautiful voices. They take care of the waterfalls, uh, the babies, a lot of the flowers. But they're in this glory cloud. They're the one part of the worship angels the enemy did not get. And we replace all those worship angels. Uh, Lucifer was over one-third of the angels. The archangel was over all the worship angels. And they're the only ones he got when he fell. They were his own. He was their leader. He couldn't convince the host or the armies that he was going to take over. And he certainly couldn't get any of Gabriel's, okay? And so he got them, and when they chose him, their whole mind became deceived. They couldn't even go back to their normal way of thinking. And so they were all kicked out with him. But he's always wanted what God had. He knew that we were gods. He didn't know what he was going to do with us. But trust me, when Adam was made in the garden, and you will notice that the enemy was already there. Some people try to say Lucifer was not kicked out of heaven during the dinosaur times. It was later on when civilization was there. But it clearly shows you that he was right there. He was in the garden. And he actually had to have permission from the snake to possess that snake. That's why God removed their legs, kids. Snakes used to have legs. They had like big hips and long skinny legs. And they could walk upright. But when that snake did that, God cursed them, took all their legs off. Isn't that weird looking? Be weird looking. Amen. But Lucifer, he, Satan was already there. And he knew when he saw God breathe that spirit of life from himself into Adam, he knew what was happening. He's sending them. And he knew he was in trouble. That's why he had to do something fast. That's why he deceived them. They gave away their dominion of the earth to him. And it was not like immediate. It wasn't immediately because it was Adam was on the earth for a while with all the animals. Uh, he called them my name. He gave them a name, not like horse, pig, cow, but he actually gave them a name, and they all talked to him. Animals had the ability to talk when God first made them in the Garden of Eden, and he took that away from them. He said, it's going to be bad enough for man to curse me. I'm not going to let their animals curse me too. And you'll notice that he had the, um, he had the donkey speak, right? The donkey already had everything he needed to speak. He just loosed those uh, those uh, muscles and the, the throat muscles and everything for him to have the ability. That's why he can teach parrots and even some dogs, if you work real hard with them, might be able to bark out, I love you or something. And having all the animals talk, including your pets. How many people are glad your pets go to heaven? Let me see your hand. It isn't a, this is not a theological discussion. And the father said, tell them it's not a theological discussion. I send them because they love them. That's it. They're, that's it. They do have a spirit. If they didn't have a spirit, they wouldn't have no life in them. There was no life in Adam, right? Dead body, perfect. No life till he breathed the spirit in. The animals have a spirit. Or the demons could not have possessed the pigs. The demons can't possess your body. They need a spirit 
and it needs to be alive, and it's true or they'd be going in the graveyards and getting everybody out and using their bodies. If people argue with you, you know, there's real simple clues to tell them they would be getting every dead body out of the graveyard and using them, amen? But what most people are experiencing, and everybody thinks everybody has a demon, some people do if they gave themselves to Satan. No, I'm serious, they really do. I've seen deliverance service where I don't care who you are, they want to cast devils out of you. Most of the time, it's the deposits in your soul that are causing you to act that way. And that's why when you do deliverance, do deliverance, they don't change. It's because they need to loose that deposit out of their soul that was made by whatever they got involved in. It can eventually become that because the word talks about it. And I have done both for years, uh, broken soul ties and got junk out of people's souls. But I didn't know about the layers. It makes it much easier to understand that that's why kids kill kids. They have deposits in their soul by the stuff they've been watching. And even, even the psychiatrists know that. They don't know about the layers, but they do know that if you feed on something long enough, it's going to affect your what? And your mind is your what? It's your soul. So it makes sense that whatever you watch or are a part of, it will affect the way you think. But, but the Father's showing me that we have layers in our soul, and whenever we watch or we go places, you make deposits in your soul. That's why the movies are so dark right now. If you want to go to the movie theater, there's almost nothing I'll go see. I'm very aware of what I go and see before I watch it. I want to know what's in that thing, because I don't want that stuff in me. And whether you believe it or not, you're going to be affected by it. And this is the good news. I always encourage people, God's about to have his own movies produced. They're actually saying in the newspapers and on TV that Hollywood is having a revival. I went there. I've had eight meetings there. Laid hands and released the fire of God into actors, actresses, producers, script writers, special effects people. The first group came. There were about 80. The next time there was 400. And they were changed. And they won't want dark stuff. They won't want dark scripts anymore. And you know what's funny? They've just about done away with God in society and in our culture. That's the enemy's plan, by the way. It's not man's, but man helps them. He helps them. And on Fox News, they were actually talking about that, that the movies that they've been producing on the PBS about the Bible, I know they've embellished it in some areas to make it more exciting, but you got to remember they don't know what actually happened. And so they're trying to make the script look good. They've been pretty accurate, but they're saying 14.2 million young people are watching those series. Young people. Young people. And they're overwhelmed because for the first time in their life, they're actually finding out who Jesus is. And they're finding out about all the stuff in the Old Testament. And they are loving it. That's encouraging. And they're all discussing, well, you know, some of these kids, the first, they'll be the first generation that ever heard about God because they stopped talking about him. They don't even know who he is. They don't want to come to church and hear about it. But they're all watching it on television. And God is going to know. I'm sure he was behind all that. But I'm talking about movies that are exciting, intense, funny, amazing, but no garbage in them. Because there's good moral people that aren't even believers that are sick of the junk that's being put out there. But this is why they're doing it. God said their soul is filled with darkness. So that's how they think. So that's why the script writers write the dark scripts. That's why the producers want to produce them because there's darkness in them. What, they're filled with darkness. What's going to come out is Darkness. He said, but if I get them and change them and they're filled with light, it's going to change what they make in Hollywood. So instead of, you know, sending fire from heaven and destroying them all and sending them to hell, God has a better plan. Because Hollywood impacts our entire society, doesn't it? And there's a difference, I'm just going to let you know this, there's a big difference in a fantasy and a spiritual lie that's being made. Harry Potter is a spiritual lie. And they're dangerous. If you watched it today, we're going to loose it all from your soul. 
because it was certainly deposited seeds of witchcraft in there. The reason why it's dangerous is because a fantasy, none of the characters are real, okay? None of those characters exist now. They never existed. It's a, it's a story, whether it's fun or what it's about. It usually does have good versus evil in it, but the good usually triumphs, okay? That's, that's a fantasy. If it doesn't have other garbage in it, then it's okay to watch. You don't want all the other junk in there. Unfortunately, they've been putting a lot of it in there. But there are some really good, fun movies out there. You have to hunt for them. Those are the ones I go and see. But things that are telling you something that's not true, that's dangerous, I'll tell you why Harry Potter's dangerous. It shows you that there's good witchcraft and there's bad witchcraft. And that is a lie. How many people say, everybody say, that's a lie. That's a lie. And yet everybody watches it. What you watch puts seeds in you. And whether you believe it or not, because you willingly watched it, you got seeded with those things in you. And the reason why it's dangerous is because one day on this earth, some of the lying signs and wonders the enemy will use to get people is that there is good witchcraft because they heal, they raise the dead, they teach you to levitate on your lunch hour, and they're good. And you can belong to them instead of Jesus Christ. And they've been seeded for years because they've been watching it. How many people get that? Let me see your hands. I do not watch any movies that show good witchcraft, good warlocks, good wizards. Those things are real. That's the difference in a fantasy. Witchcraft is real. If you don't know, there's covens everywhere. They, they do serve the enemy no matter what they say. They all have rituals and things. They sign their self to him. They really do belong to him. They're real. There's real warlocks. There's real wizards. Those things are real. And they all belong to the darkness. So the enemy wants movies made that make them look like there are good ones and there are bad ones. But that is not a good movie because they're, they're bringing a lie to you and people are receiving it. And actually, people got almost drunk on those movies. The father said the world is drunk on the wine of Harry Potter witchcraft. That's, those are his words, not mine. They're drunk on the wine of Harry Potter witchcraft. And he said they did celebrations and parties all about it. They wanted to be his image. And yet that's not good. That is not a fantasy. That is a lie that the enemy is trying to feed you. And God is opening people's eyes. This has to do with the spirit realm. It's not just something you're watching. That's a portal, that screen. That's a portal. Your TV screen is a portal. The movie screens are portals. The iPhone, these are portals. These are all portals. A portal is something you can see something through and receive something through. And whatever you decide to watch, that gets deposited in your soul. And that's why so many homes are being torn up. That's why they're being torn up by adultery, by murder, by alcohol, by drugs, by horrible language, because they fill their atmosphere of their home with it when they watch it. Those are spirits attached to everything that's made, and they, they have the ability, because they're spirits, to enter in it. Now, if you watch the good things, you can have joy, fun, excitement deposited in you, and it's going to be expressed in the way you live your life. And if you fill yourself with enough of the darkness, you're going to start making decisions that would not be God's decisions. You're going to think on things that drag you into more of that stuff because it's in your soul. You fill your soul with it. And God said that there should only be light in you. But he said, when you begin to put darkness in you, and if the darkness you have is the only light you have, how great is that darkness? That's what he's talking about. Because the darkness is going to pull you into more darkness. And that's why some people marry somebody who's abusive. They divorce them. They marry someone else just like them. And they divorce them and marry someone else just like them and divorce them. And you know what it is? Deposits in their soul. The thing that's different about that kind of relationship when you have a physical relationship with other people, when you get married, you actually give a layer of your soul to that person. It's tying the knot. And they give a layer of them to you. So you're carrying around this other person's. That's why when someone dies, you grieve so bad. If family members, you make relationships with each other. Those are emotional relationships, but you can make an so emotional soul tie. That's why you grieve if you love them so much. 
because you're, you're tied together. It's about your soul. But when you have an abusive relationship and that stays inside of you, it will drag you because it affects your what? Thinking and your choices. And if it's in there, it'll pull you into the same kind of relationship over and over. If you're hooked on an addiction, if you're addicted to something, you get a layer of that addiction deposited in your soul and it pulls you back into the same thing over. This is what the father told me. He showed me what a human soul looked like. He said, now I'm going to tell you how it operates so my body can be free and stay free. And it actually explains why people do things. And he said, when they get addicted to something, they gave themselves to it. And then when they get that addiction deposited in here, that that's in you gives you the craving for it. And you want more and more. And the more you put in, the more it affects the way you think, the way you live your life. Then you become oppressed, depressed, because you can't have what you are desiring on the inside of you. And it all has to do with your soul. Let's all say this scripture together. I desire above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Now let's turn it around. Even as your soul prospers, you will prosper and you will be in health. That's why the body of Christ is sick, depressed, and fearful because they're putting all that junk in their soul. And they cannot prosper if your soul is not whole. He wants your soul whole. Tonight, everybody's soul is gonna be whole. And the thing is this, you may watch stuff after your kids go to bed, but you let it in the house. I'm sorry to tell you that, but you are in charge of the atmosphere of your home. That's why there's such accountability with the head of the house that the enemy's been going after for years. If he can get stuff into him, he lets it in his house. Unfortunately, that we are and our kids are affected by it, which isn't, people say it's not fair, but you know what? God set you to be a covering and a protector and to raise your child in the admonition of the Lord. He didn't ask you to raise them with the world filled with them. And I'm not saying you can't have fun. I don't know of anyone that wants you to have more fun than God. If he plans to have fun with you in heaven, he wants you to have fun down here. We need to start using our creativity to make things that are fun, right? Everybody look up and say, God, God. give me witty ideas, me witty ideas. And, inventions and inventions so I can make some fun stuff, so fun stuff. that's going to be safe and everyone's going to love it. Amen. You just asked him. He is already doing that, by the way. He intends for this time that we're in to be lived in victory, even in the midst of darkness, which we will push back for a season. We will push it back until they have to play. They will build places of darkness to live in because the realms of glory that will be in some cities, they won't want to be there. People go, you're talking about the millennial reign. I am not talking about the millennial reign. He will not need us to do that stuff. He'll be sitting on the throne in Jerusalem as king of the world. He won't need us to do that then. He needs us to do it now. Amen. How many people get that? That if you start something and the generations follow behind you doing the same thing, it increases. I'm like this because I have like five generations behind me that I chose to walk on what they did. I didn't overnight become like this. My great, great grandparents, my great grandparents, my grandmother, my father all knew God. They saw supernatural things happen. Some of them were seers. Some heard him clearly. But somebody in that family line decided to keep doing that. And that's why I'm like this. I'm his friend. You are his friend. But he's already processed me, amen? The good news is you don't get 40 years to be processed. I've been processed a long time to make sure I wouldn't judge, I wouldn't criticize, I wouldn't embellish. I would only say what he said to say. And I would only do what he said to do. Amen? And that's why he needs a messenger to come and bring a message that's going to bring hope. He is not sending fear. He is not. He said, fear not. Didn't he say that? Take no thought for your life. 
However, if you go back to Matthew 6 again, and what does it say in 633? This is the time when he wants the kingdom established in our lives. So if you're in lack or if you're in fear, what does 633 say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you're going through stuff right now, I would encourage you to seek to establish what God wants in this earth right now. And then you won't have any lack and you won't have any fear in your life because this is God's time to have his way in this earth. And one of the things he's doing is wanting to keep you free so you get filled with him and be a powerful messenger for him. But he's not going to wait for you to get straightened out. Amen. You're going to get something imparted into you, not tonight, in a few minutes to help your spirit get a supercharge to get ready to manifest for God. Amen? How many people are happy about that? God only shows you things so you can be greater and you can live in victory. He wants you whole. But when you keep giving layers, that's why some people look empty and they have no feelings whatsoever. They gave their soul away. People go, you can sell your soul to the devil. You don't have to. You give it away. There's a scripture that says, do not fear the one who can destroy the flesh, but fear the one that can destroy your Because then you won't have your own mind. And you won't think, you won't even be able to make a choice. That's why people are in mental institutions, because sometimes they did things, they got involved in things that totally consumed their whole will and their mind. But do you know that if you can get somebody who's having thoughts of suicide, this is the good news about the soul thing. If you can get somebody who still can think right and they keep having dreams or things, thoughts of suicide, if you can get them to loose that despair from their soul, they will no longer have those thoughts. Despair is the thing that brings that on people. If you can get them to even say it with their, with their, with their mouth as an act of my will, I choose to loose the despair from myself it can't say no because whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven amen actually this whole message about the soul is the keys to the kingdom because he wants us to establish the kingdom amen and you can get people set free from so many. we've had people set free immediately from cigarettes from alcohol from pornography instantly because they loosed it from their soul with an act of their will and it had to go. People who have nightmares and torments, they loosed it from their soul and they don't have them anymore. Amen? Praise God. So we're gonna do that in a few minutes. But first, before I do that, I'm gonna say something else to the kids. Uh, uh, all the kids stand up here real quick. If you're 16 or under, or if you're 18 and you still act like a kid, Let's just say, if you're, if you're 18 or under, stand up. <laughs> you are very special to God. Because most of you actually still want to have fun. Most of you are not caught up in the stuff going around in the world. And most of you can actually hear him better than the adults. You have no problem believing that God actually has Jello land and the dinosaur park and hoverboards and an amusement park where you learn to fly like Superman and he teaches you how. You get so excited to know that God cares that much about you to have fun things. And I will also tell you that you are very important to him right now. That you receive and understand the things he's trying to say. That the choices you make, even as a child, are very important. The other thing is this. When you honor your parents... What does that mean? It means you don't fuss at them very much. That means you listen if they need help with something. You have to remember they are giving you a home to live in. They are feeding you. They get things for you. They make it possible for you to do things. If you didn't have them, you'd be in a lot of trouble. So cut them some slack, okay? Write them a note saying you love them. You'd be surprised how much we enjoy getting that. And I tell you, every one of you, when you reach the age of about 22 or 23, will write this note. Dear Mom, I am so sorry I did not listen to you. I'm so sorry I didn't understand all the sacrifice that you did for me. But now that I have my own three-year-old, I understand completely what you were going through. So please know this. I love you. I love you. I love you. I have received a note like that from every one of my daughters. Uh, but when you honor them, that means you offer 
believe it or not, to help them. You go in there and actually say once a week, do you need help? Can I do something for you? And then they will faint on the floor. And after they pick themselves up, just make sure whatever it is you volunteer to do, you do it, okay? And this is what God will do. He will reward you. He will bless you. And your daddy in heaven can give you a lot of things that your parents can't. I'm not promising you'll be flooded with all kinds of things, but I have seen so many kids get blessed. When they start doing this, you will get blessings from God. Because when you love God's parents, your parents, God loves you. He loves you anyway, but he will bless you for doing it. Trust me. We're asking him all the time. Please, God, speak to them. Help them know how much I love them. I'm not trying to be mean. I just want to protect them. There's something built in us that's like the Father that we must protect you. So we're not trying to keep you from having fun. But if God has shown us things are dangerous, it's our job to let you know. Amen? So God, everybody, all the, all the kids, raise your hands. Everybody, if you want a blessing, raise it right now. I'm going to let you know how much God loves you. Father, I ask you within the next 30 days to bless every child that has their hand raised. I want you to give them something that even their parents could never give them, and they're going to know it's from you. And when they get it, I want them to look up and say, Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. And all of you said, Amen. You just got it. Sit down. Now your kids can testify. And they're probably going to be real good, at least for a while. I tell people, my mom had 15 kids. We had one bathroom. And they were all chiefs, no Indians. And my mom kept an empty suitcase by the front door. And we knew when she had had it. And I didn't know one time she was watching me on live streaming, listening to me tell this on her. But she finally had it with all my brothers fussing and fighting, and nobody would get the alligator out of the bathtub so we could take our baths. They were eating all the food in the pantry, so she had nothing much to make us for dinner but lollipops and tomato soup. You know, I mean, we would drag every friend we had, so there was 30 for dinner, not just us. And when she finally had the fussing and the, and the, and the, and the uh, go stuff going on in the house, she would finally had enough of it. She always had a new baby, you know, I mean, I, Thank God she stopped having them. I knew what she looked like normally. She'd walk over to the, the front door and pick her suitcase up. And we knew we were all in trouble. <laughs> She'd go out the fence and start walking down the street. She would not look behind her. She would not. And we were all in a trail behind her, <laughs> including me. Now, I hadn't done anything wrong because I was one of the helpers. So I was carrying the little one saying, you're not going anywhere because I'm not being stuck with them. And the rest of them were, they were all repenting to my mother as she went, please, I, I'm so sorry, I repent, I repent, I will be good, please come home, please. Because we were thinking about what it would be like if we have to live by ourselves. And my dad traveled sometimes, and, um, and the thing about my mom was, I think the only joy she ever got was when she spanked us. <laughs> now you know your mama will say, this is gonna hurt me more than you, and she's grinning. Grinning the whole time she's doing it. My dad would cry when he had to spank us because he had such a soft heart. But my mom, it was her reward. <laughs> and we had a plum tree out back, and those branches can grow six feet long, and they have little tiny nubs. Now, she didn't beat us really hard. But she, she would whip us, what part of us she could reach, whatever was in the way. She could get it, she's only four foot 11. When you were 10, you were taller than her. But she would, my brother, she'd say, go pick your own punishment. And my brothers needed a whole lot more intelligence. They would bring back a branch that big. On purpose, every, every time they go get a branch like that, and she goes, I'm gonna get my own. She'd get the six footers. And they'd make her chase them. That made her matter because she was Irish and she hadn't learned how to ask grace for abundant life yet and she would get a hold of us and man we'd be good for a little while I got hardly no spankings ask my mama she'll tell you I was one of the good ones uh, I wanted a, my chocolate candy bar she paid me once a week that's what I got paid for watching them and I enjoyed every bite of those candy bars okay 
But anyway, uh, my mom had, had, I tell everybody, my mom has a greater reward than anybody in my family because she had to put up with all of them and raise all of them. And she chooses to live with me. That should tell you something right now. My dad's in heaven on his massive ranch with all of our pets, thousands of them that he himself let us have. Amen. So I saw my pets in heaven. And, uh, but she is still mama. And if you get in trouble or get something wrong, she will call you and tell you. And uh, she's 81. She wants to go zip lining this year for her birthday. <laughs> she has a Harley trike. <laughs> and she doesn't plan on going anywhere for a very long time. And my mother now has to have a warehouse to keep all of her gifts in. She gets spoiled by every one of them. All the brothers that caused her all the problems, they shower her with gifts, they take her places. They tried to move away from the city, but they loved her so much they had to move back. So we have over 100 family members in my city, isn't that lovely? <laughs> and I know, I can picture our places in heaven, we'll probably have a city. And they'll all come to my mom and probably tell her once again, here's more gifts, mom, I'm gonna give them through you all through eternity, amen? So please be nice to your parents. They need all the help they can get, amen? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to stand up in a minute and loose any deposits that were made in you. Now, sometimes it's something you had that was real traumatic. You might have to do that separately for the adults. You may have to do it separately. But there'll be all kinds of stuff to leave people. Fear, will, fear is the number one thing that will leave you. You will not have fear in you. Don't let it come back, okay? Don't let it come back in you. Uh, you need to believe what God says in his word that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover this earth like the waters cover the sea, that the world will know us by our love for each other, that there will be supernatural things that he will do in the last days, that we will manifest his power. The word says that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just and the righteous, and that has not happened, and he is not going to miss doing that. He has plans on how to do that. He's going to have many people become entrepreneurs. The believers will have a lot of the answers, a lot of the cures. There is a cure for cancer coming. I know people said they found it. There's going to be cures for five major diseases. There's going to be alternative fuels on the earth. So the only one who can change anything is say, everybody say, the Father, the Father. and Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. are the only ones who can change our land. And everybody overseas say our country right now, amen? Because they do have a plan for planet Earth. And he wants you to be a part of it, amen? You live in some of the most exciting times that will ever be on this Earth. Everybody says there's gonna be a last great move of God. Even the ones who are saying the doom and gloom is coming, it's gonna end, and the tribulation is gonna take place supposedly tomorrow, some people think. I will still be here. I will be here. I have a 25-year assignment when I'm done with this one. And I'm not going to miss that assignment. I've known about it for 40 years. And so just be ready to be here and to enjoy your life and watch what the hand of your God does. Amen? When he starts doing things and people see it, they're all going to understand this is not the end. But these things have to happen that are happening now. So everybody stand up. This is very simple. Like everything God does, he makes it simple for us. He wants your soul to be whole. And one of the things you will notice almost immediately is you will begin to prosper in areas in your life. The other thing I have to teach you, or I will be in trouble, is how to ask for grace for abundant life. It's in the word of God. There is grace for eternal life. You get that through the blood of Jesus Christ. But be, because you belong to him, you can go before the throne of grace. That's God's throne. And ask for grace in time of need. You can find grace from him. What grace am I talking about? The grace that his son was filled with as a child, the word said. The grace that Paul learned about when he stopped asking for the thorn of flesh to be removed because that grace was sufficient. There is grace for abundant life. And God caught me up to his throne and said, I'm going to teach you something that will change your life. If you teach it to your family, it'll change the atmosphere of your home. If you teach it to your staff, it'll change the atmosphere of your office. And this is very simple. God said that it's like manna in the wilderness. He offers it. But sometimes you have to ask. Say, ask, ask. And, you will find. and you will find. If we knock, knock. 
he will answer. You have not because you ask not. We're going to learn to ask. He caught me up to his throne and he said, every morning before you get out of your bed and open your mouth, if you will say these words, you will come out of your room different because you will be fuel, filled with fuel for, from heaven for that day. And I have more people comment later. It changed their life faster than anything I taught them. If you look up to heaven, everybody do this. Hold your hands out. Say, Father, Father I, ask for, I ask for and receive grace, and receive grace this, day this day for abundant life. For abundant life. Amen. Amen. Now, I feel it being poured into me right now. I literally feel it being poured from heaven. Every time I say that, I feel it. I just got more. Now, what that does is no matter what you face, you will not respond the same way. They're the only ones who know what you will face, and you just got fuel that will take you through that day, and you will still be in victory. You will find that if you do that every morning, fear cannot get on the inside of you. Offense cannot get on the inside of you. It really does happen. My, my family, my, my family, if they ask for grace, you know. If they don't, you know. Because they come and they show up and they're picking, nitpicking and complaining. And even myself, if I forget to ask, I will be like that. And they will point at me and they'll go, you go get grace. I have a sign on my door that says, ask for grace. To remind them before they come in, you better ask, amen. It will change you, honestly. You need to write it down somewhere. Uh, eventually, I'm going to have signs to give out to everybody when they come. It's going to say, ask for grace today. If you forget and go out there and realize you're having one of the worst days of your life, it'll be because you forgot. Just turn around. Father, I ask for to receive grace right now. Amen. And if something just out of the blue hits you sideways and knocks you out of that grace, Run inside a little room somewhere and just say, okay, Father, I need more. I just felt more come in me. He will do it because he wants to bless you. He wants you to live in victory, and you need that grace for abundant life, especially these days. Amen? Because people are going to come to you and throw all kinds of things at you all week long, and it's going to, you know, you don't want it to affect your thinking or anything. You ask for that grace, and then teach everybody in your family about it. Amen? So right now, we're going to look up, and when we do this, we're going to loose all the junk from us first, and I wait for a minute, because I actually see stuff leave people. It's leaving you like fear, unbelief, whatever it is that's been put in your soul, it'll leave, because you're going to tell it it has to. It's what the Word says. Wherever you bind on earth, will be bound. If the love of God is bound in your soul, it's bound. It can't be taken from you, Amen. But if you bind an offense to you, that's bound, right? It's going to affect you. So when you lose stuff, it can't refuse to go because you use your will. That's why God gave you one. And what you choose to do with your will, you will do it. Amen? And God said whatever you choose to watch with your eyes, knowing what it is, he said you are saying you approve of that. And you need to gauge your life by that, okay? You need to gauge it like that. Amen? Because he wants to do powerful things with you. So we're going to look up to heaven. Everybody can, well, you close your eyes. And just say, Father, Father I don't want any darkness in me. No fear. No unbelief. No offense. Nothing of the enemy. So right now, as an act of my will, I choose to loose it from my soul right now in Jesus' name. See, I feel stuff leaving people. Just not even with my eyes closed, I can feel it. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Now we're going to say this. Say, Father, Father I, want I want my soul to be whole. To be whole. So as an, will, as an act of my will, I call back, I call back all, those all those parts of myself 
that I gave away. Right now, I call it back into my soul that I, so I can be whole. In Jesus' name, come back. I tell you, what I see, even with my eyes closed, I see transparent images of people stepping back inside of their self right now. Those are the layers of yourself that you gave away to things, to places, people, or things. Amen? Now look up and say, Father, Father I, thank you I thank you that now, now my, soul my soul is whole. Is whole. When my soul prospers... I now will prosper and be in health. So right now, I want you to download from heaven into my soul your love, your life, your presence. In Jesus' name, I receive it. Woo, I feel stuff being poured out everywhere. Just say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank, you, Holy Spirit, thank you, Holy Spirit, for loving me, for, loving me. for caring enough, for caring enough. To, send to send revelation. Amen. You can sit down. Praise God. Hallelujah. Um, we're actually doing pretty good. Thank you. I'm right now. Usually, I'll tell you how we do this. I'm going to actually just lay hands on you, and I'm going to all I'm going to say is manifest. Uh, you'll probably be the second group of people God has had me do this to, and um, tomorrow I'm going to talk about what happened when Christ, uh, when His Spirit left the cross. I'll talk a little bit about before, but we need to see him as the risen Lord. You need to know what happened on the third day. So I have a message called the third day. What happened when he entered into hell? What happened to the thief? Because he said, today you will be with me in paradise. I'm going to tell you what happened because he took me back and showed me. Now, if God takes you somewhere, the word says he's seen the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And if he uses you, he can take you anywhere he wants to. Say, God can take me anywhere he wants to. He can take me to the beginning, or he can take me to the end, because he's already been there. Many times he caught me up and showed me things. He showed me heaven before Lucifer fell. He showed me how Lucifer fell. He showed me how the original earth was made. He showed me what happened, which is one of my favorite things, what happened when Christ released his spirit from the cross? What happened to the thief? What happened in Abraham's bosom, which almost nobody talks about? When you died before Christ poured out his blood in heaven, when you died, you did not ascend to heaven. You descended into this beautiful place called Abraham's bosom or paradise. It had two names. Think of what paradise. I think of Hawaii, how gorgeous it is and everything. Nothing you imagine can compare to what paradise looked like. I've seen paradise. It was a beautiful place. It had skies. It had rivers. It had beautiful buildings in it. And Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of the righteous dead were kept there. And there was a great gulf. It really looks like a huge, deep valley, but it was a little bit higher, and it was in the earth. It was a spiritual place. So none of the lava or the rocks had nothing to do with this place. We try to mix it up in our mind. How can it be there when that stuff is there? The spiritual realm can exist anywhere. No matter where physical things are, it doesn't matter. So this beautiful spiritual place called Abraham's bosom or paradise was a little bit higher up. Then there was a great gulf, and then lower was hell. They couldn't see all of hell, but hell has an entrance. It actually does have gates. It has an entrance where the wicked dead are received, not in very nice ways. But it does have an area there. Then it goes off into uh, pits and all kinds of, I won't go into hell. I've seen there. I've seen that place. But this was special when he let me see what happened when it said Jesus spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of it openly 
triumphing in it. And when he took the keys to hell, death, and the grave. And that's the message you're going to hear tomorrow. Amen. I would try to come if you possibly can. Amen. If not, try to get the tapes. Because it's going to be really a big eye-opener to let you know how much the devil does not have power over you. And you will shout and yell when you hear what he did to all the hierarchy in Satan's realm. Why did it take three days? You'll find out. Are those literal keys? You will find out. What did the demons do when Jesus started manifesting the power of God? The same thing they're going to do when you start doing it. That's why you need to hear what he did. What happened over here in Abraham's bosom who could plainly see what was going on? And did they know who Jesus was? Absolutely. Yes, they did. They knew before he appeared there. Y'all looking. You're going to have to wait till tomorrow for that message. <laughs> but I'm, it's Colossians. It's Revelation on Colossians. And it changes you and what you think because there's so much more. He did die on the cross, but you, know, you need to know the good part. Where he got to display God's power and hell had him and thought they were going to keep him. And if you can just think about this, the same thing is happening right now. Darkness thinks they've won because God's saying nothing and he's doing nothing. So they think they have won just like Satan thought he had the son of God. God didn't come on day one. He didn't come on day two. He thought he was more powerful than God. And the more arrogant he got as the time went by, he got more puffed up and more arrogant just like he did in heaven when he thought he was going to take over heaven. And God said nothing and did nothing until he was ready. Well, you will find out what he did. And they were really sorry that they all gathered together to watch their leader torture the Son of God. And you're going to find out what they did in Abraham's bosom. Amen. You're going to know why so many people, they said that over 500 were seen that had died. And they saw them walking around the earth. You're going to find out why that happened. You get a lot of answers when God brings revelation on one part of the scripture. It makes you understand so much of the scripture. And I'll just give you this last one for free about what happened with Moses that so many people have interpreted wrong. When he told Moses, I will hide you in the cleft of the rock. And as I pass by, I will let you see my hinder parts. And everybody says he had to show him his back because it wasn't as glorious as the front. Everybody, everybody interprets that scripture. He had only could see the back of God because he couldn't see the face of God. That is not what God said to him. This is what he said. I will hide you in my secret place. And I will show you all the time that has passed behind me. And that's how he knew to write those first five books of the Bible. Because he wasn't there when Adam and Eve was made. But God showed him all the time from that moment that had passed behind him. He showed Moses, who was his friend. Because later when he came down the mountain, he had seen God face to face and had to wear the veil. That shows you the difference in man's interpretation of the scriptures and God's revelation. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? And if you turn around what was said in the Bible, you, you really find out what God said, just like the soul thing. If you say it backwards, as your soul prospers, I will prosper and be in health. Because they talk like poets in heaven. And many times God flips things, and especially the Holy Spirit will flip things. I don't say you'll be changed forever. I say you'll be forever changed, because that's how they talk in heaven. If you just turn around what he said, I will show you the hinder parts. I will show you the parts that are behind. And as I pass by, as he passes, you'll see all the time that has passed behind him. Amen. So that way now because people go, how did he write those books? He wasn't there. I have another clue for you in the book of John. How did John know about the word? Because he wrote that scripture. How did he know that? Because he was shown him when he was the word and when he did those things. God many times took people to heaven or took them back in time and showed them things. That's how they knew to say those things because they were not alive when those things happened. And John said the word was with God and the word was God. 
and he wasn't anything made that he did not make. And then later he says, the word became flesh. So he even called Jesus the word that was his name. How did he know that? He was so close to Jesus. Why do you think he was always with him? Because he was the one who really pursued to know him above all the other disciples. He's the only disciple that was not martyred that died from old age. The only one, all the rest of them were martyred. It was that intimacy he had with Jesus. So he showed him things that he didn't show other people. Amen? So he took Moses and actually let him see all the time of the history that had passed by uh, actually since the earth was made with Adam and Eve. Amen? Say, praise God. So when he brings revelation on the scripture, it opens up a lot of things, just like the angels, the watcher angels, explains all the things. By the way, that's how the Aztecs civilization was greater than the others. Those angels who fell, they were put here as watcher angels. They left their former estate and went beyond the bounds they were made for. They were made for one thing, to help educate the people on the earth. God sent them. He had a contract with them. He said, this is the estate, what I'm putting you in. You have bounds around you. You cannot intermix with them except to educate them. So that their knowledge would increase because Adam and Eve had cut that off in the garden when they sinned. They didn't have the ability for God to teach them himself. So he sent these watcher angels. And some of them desired to marry the daughters of, of man. So they did, but they, they said, we just want to marry them. You know, we love them. They went way beyond that. They went from doing that because when they stepped outside the bounds God set for them, they lost what they had with God. They made themselves available for the enemy to consume them, and some of them became gods to the Aztecs, to the Egyptians, to the Mayans. And that's why those civilizations were greater and did greater things than the other ones on the earth. Say amen. Okay, we're going to stand up now, and I'm going to just... Uh, Lay my hand on your shoulder, and there's a reason why I'm doing that, because the shoulder represents governmental authority. If you're a believer, you have governmental authority on this earth, but also in the spirit realm. And the thing that people aren't doing is you need to take your authority in the spirit realm. You can take it over this earth, and you have dominion over the ground, the water, and the air in this earth. We're about to start doing that and stopping the earthquakes. Like I was talking about the other day, stop them and make them put it back. That's the manifested Son of God. You're already walking in your authority in the spirit realm that Jesus won for you. You'll find about that tomorrow. But you need to understand you have authority over all the power of the enemy. He doesn't have any right to mess with you, but he's going to try. And if you let him get away with it, he's going to have fun doing it. You stop him. Amen? So what God is going to do is he's about to have us to begin to manifest in that authority in the earth. And that will drive the enemy out of our lives, our homes, and sometimes whole regions on this earth. That's why he's going to go wild when the perilous times come and the tribulation comes. That's why he's going, to be, he's going to be loose to do whatever he wants to. But we are going to take our authority for the first time. And in the spirit realm, you are kings and priests unto your God. You have authority over all the power of the enemy. That's what the word says. Amen. So when I lay hands on you, I'm going to put it on your shoulder like this. I'm just going to say manifest. God is going to impart into you the ability to begin to think like a manifested son and daughter. And you will actually be able to see yourself doing those things that he wants you to do. It's going to start getting you ready on the inside. And it's going to cause excitement and anticipation for him to do things with you instead of the doom and gloom stuff. And some of that stuff will always happen until the perilous times get here. But it is going to be different on this planet for a long season. Amen? So I'm going to lay hands on everybody, including the children. And what we normally do is people come out and we make a line like that starts somewhere, but it goes around the whole back of the church. And as that line keeps coming, you're going to walk past me so I don't wear myself out. And there's something left for tomorrow. You just walk up. I'm only going to just lay my hands out. You're going to go manifest. And, and because this is live streaming, if we're still live streaming, anybody out there who wants it, just put your hands on your own shoulder right now. And I'm just going to do it right now. And I'm going to say manifest. In Jesus' name, you just got it, amen? People always tell me, I didn't get to be there. Receive it for yourself, amen? If you can hear it or see this meeting, receive it for yourself. So we need people to, I guess, I don't know how you want to do this, I guess, the, like the first row, and then, I don't know how to do this. My mind doesn't think very well in the natural realm, but somehow we need to get like a long line going, 
And then it's very quick. It does not take very long. We can either do one row at a time and just walk past me and then go sit down and then everybody else. And then I'm going to speak a blessing over everybody. Okay, good. Let's just simply do this. This section here, you guys can sit for a second. And uh, this section here, start front row. Come right here. Start right here, Wanda. You fill in and then you're next. And then you follow afterwards. And when this row is done, when you're done, go that way and go all the way out around the back and back in. And then we'll start with this row or this section next, okay? So you guys get in line here. Sam, come on around so she knows where um, the end of the line is. Uh, if you still have my flash drive, would you put some images up here? Um, which one? Um, let's go ahead and put the breath of God, if you can find the angel. That's fine. And we'll just put, put it up there, let people out there see. Can I have Roy Dare this? and um, Randy okay. up here. How many people can see the very center? Cliff Good, would you come on? I know he's got a laser. The very center of this picture. Oh, I'll, I'll, let me hold it, baby. I want you to see this angel that appeared. How do I turn it on? This one? If you guys want to sit in the back, oh. you can until your row's coming up. You Helps can, if so I don't turn around backwards. Oh, there. This is the face of the angel. How many people see it? There's his forehead. There's his nose, his eye sockets. There's his chin. There's his mouth. It's open. He's blowing the breath of God out of his mouth. How many people see that? Raise your hand. It's right here in the middle. This is a real angel. It's not a cloud. Some of them are made out of things not that were not. Behind him is a lion. Now, I'm going to show you the lion. There's one eye. There's his other eye. There's even a pupil. There's an eyebrow. There's his muzzle. There's his ear right there. And he came in this portal to open. This, this angel dropped his face down through the portal. This, this lion came in here with him. There's actually four more lions. It's too hard to point them out. You can see their eyes over here. And it was, he's blowing the breath of God out of his mouth. And this appeared over our state. How many people see that? Is that awesome? That, that's not a little tiny fuzzy figure that's real. That's real. And you could take that anywhere to any printing place and they will tell you we did not Photoshop it. They put those things into print and they know if you generated it on your computer or if you actually took that picture. And they just about faint when they start printing them for us because they know it's real. Amen. And just because there's new people, you can put the fire angel up there and we'll just leave him up there. This other angel appeared walking on our river. And actually, these angels appear. Here he is. There's his arms coming out of his chest. This is his head, his hair. These are his wings, and he's walking on our river. He's carrying in his hand a deposit of the fire of God to leave on this earth. How many people see him? Everybody. Because the angels of the Lord are here to protect us. Both of those are angels that guard us. Amen? We're just going to let him stay up there while I do this. And um, somebody can hold this for me. Uh, this is this is really very very quick, and so just come up. I'm just lay hands on you. No, no, you can turn around this way. Face me. Sorry, face me. Manifest. Now, some of you might fall. Some of you may not fall. It doesn't mean anything if you don't feel it. It's an impartation from the Father. It is going to go inside of you. Amen. Manifest. 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 This is not from me. This is from your father. Manifest. 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 I get goosebumps on me every time I do it. Feel God. Manifest. 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 Just receive it when you get it, okay? Manifest. 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 Manifest means to make plainly, clearly known 
through your actions and your words what you represent. Manifest. Manifest. It's easy if you turn and face me, okay? Manifest. 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 I'm going to get really gone in about two seconds. Manifest. Manifest. There's a reason why I'm wearing the keys tonight, by the way. Manifest. I'm talking about the keys to the kingdom. Manifest. Manifest. If you want to have symbols of the, the kingdom age in your home, you need to get keys, crowns, peacock feathers. Peacocks represent the living creatures on this earth. That's why they have an eye in every one of their feathers. And all the colors on the peacock are colors in the throne room. Amen? That's why you see in the fashion today, I see all the colors, purple, teal, blue, I mean, uh, sapphire, blue, teal, are three different colors in the throne room. I, I'll, I'll pe repeat that. Turquoise or teal, um, sapphire, blue, purple, gold, those are all throne room colors. And you're gonna, you already see them in the fashions. And that's, that's not a coincidence, okay? So those are all throne room colors. You got some on right here. Manifest. And God loves pink. <laughs> Manifest. 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 If you weren't here last night, God's the one who asked me to have the pink hair. Manifest. 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 It's coming to the body of Christ, so just get ready. Manifest. Not doesn't have to be pink, but. Manifest, but wait till you leave home to get it done. Manifest, but you parents, hey. Manifest. 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 Boy, how many of you got those colors on? Manifest. 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 Y'all remind me of us. Look at all of you together in a row. <laughs> Multiply. It doesn't matter. My mom said, after you have five or six, it doesn't change. There's just a whole lot more. Manifest. 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 Some of you are gonna be writers. I if I if if you have if I see like a feather pen attached to you guys that I'm putting a, a pen in the hand of ready writers. Some of you might write movie scripts. You might think you're writing books, but they actually will become movie scripts, so, amen? Manifest. 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 
manifest. You also receiving some of the love of God in you. Anytime I touch anybody, you're going to get that fire, that passion from God because he loves you. Manifest. 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 <laughs> oh, I, I'll just put. I'll put it on his head. Manifest. <laughs> Manifest. <laughs> Can't escape the call of God. <laughs> Manifest. <laughs> Manifest. 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 <laughs> Manifest. 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 Amen. <laughs> Manifest. Manifest. No matter what you look like on the inside, on the outside, on the inside, you are powerful. Manifest. 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 <laughs> 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 Manifest. 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 There. Now, each and every one of you just received a commission from your father. Amen. He will open doors for you. There's a lot of things that are different about this time that we're in. It's, he calls it an accelerated time. If you haven't noticed, and over the last year, the uh, ripping away of the veil of the darkness in our own country, but not just here, really around the world, it's amazing what's happened in the last year that we never saw happen prior to this. And people are saying that the darkness is just, you know, it's taken over. That is not what happened. God ripped away the veil that it was hiding behind. And you have to totally see it that way, that 
God allows what he allows for a reason. He's wanting to expose the darkness that's really always been here, but we weren't aware of it. And every day you're hearing more and more about it being exposed. But when you see it, this is what you need to say. God is exposing that so it can be taken down. When I was growing up, even little, like maybe 11, 12 or something, the father would always tell me, if I ever expose darkness to you, you have the authority to take it down. And the body needs to change their mindset. Instead of just thinking, oh, now this is going to happen. Don't let that enter into your mind. That just came from the enemy. Because he's trying to let you think that it's all going to be taken over and everything. No, you stand up. You use your words to take authority. Every time, I challenge you, every time you see something that talks about that this is a time for the world to end, that the darkness is taken over, all these other things are happening, you need to say, but may God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is the most important thing you can say. And if you can speak, if you can't speak, write it. But I'm challenging you, start doing something against the darkness. Because what you're saying is, no, it doesn't matter if you're there, God is going to do something about it. Then you show God you really believe he's going to do something. you never seen him excited before. You actually can get God excited. By the way, you respond to things he's just shown you. You didn't just hear a message tonight, you got changed. And you got empowered through impartation. And so there's something new inside of you you never had before. We have hope because we have God. And people tell me, you talk a lot about God, but not Jesus. I talk about Jesus just as much. Are you kidding? He, I am so in love with him. And you are so in love with him in heaven that even if for some chance a family member doesn't make it, your whole love goes to the Lord. You really do fall in love with him. Somebody, you have a problem knowing that. It's not like our physical love. It's something way beyond that, that you really do know and understand what he did with himself for you. And this is the other thing I'm going to challenge you, that just because you didn't see your family member repeat a sinner's prayer does not mean they didn't make it to heaven. Even as they're dying, the Lord can present himself to them if you have stood for their salvation. Now, earlier I talked about the fact that you can lose your salvation because the word says, pray that your name not be blotted out. But we have a surety and assurance from the Lord because we belong to him. It says, you in your household shall be saved. How does that happen? You stand for their salvation. The word says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Now, when you do that, it has to be according to God's will. Okay. If it's God's will and, and Jesus in, is in you and his word is in you, then you can ask him for your family member's salvation and he will pursue them. Honestly, the Lord told me that there'd be so many people shocked to see who made it to heaven, even though they prayed for them to be there. You don't know what happened. Even if they're in a coma, their spirit is aware of what is being said and what is going on. Many people have come out of comas and said, I heard everything you said to me. Never stop standing for their salvation. But once you've done that, don't repeat all the bad things they're doing. Because then you're being, say, double-minded. A double-minded man gets what from the Lord? Nothing. So it says, if you make a stand, you stand there for. And God wants you to know, if you keep a stand for your family's salvation, uh, it can be your bloodline, it can be married in, it could be somebody that you call a family member. I know friends that are just as close as my family. If you stand for their salvation, I don't just ask for the ones who are with me. I ask for the generations coming behind me. And I want you to know that some of you made it in because of the generations who came before you and declared and claimed the generations coming after them that they would know the Lord and serve the Lord. Amen. So we do have promises he's given us. When you belong to him and give yourself to him, you get so many more benefits than you know of. Amen. But in the days that are coming on the earth, you're going to start seeing a lot of those manifest. He does desire that you do not lack. God didn't create lack. He did not create poverty. But the body of Christ is about to do something to help a lot of the poor. 
Amen. Because most of us, our greatest desire is to give and to help. And in the days coming, in the months and the years coming, you're going to have plenty to give and help. Amen. That's one of the promises that he gave me. It's one of the signs that we're entering into a new time on earth. Things will be done differently. The body of Christ will start to dress differently. You'll look differently. He said that the body of Christ is about to lead on the radical edge in this world. And it will shock and stun a lot of the world that we look awesome. And we look different from the others. Amen. It doesn't mean you're going to become adapted to the world. It means the world's going to start wanting to look like you because Christ in you the hope of glory the glory that's on the inside is going to start being displayed on the outside and he's bringing whole new fashion lines to this world through believers that will be the most exciting things to have and the world instead of running after all the other stuff is going to want the stuff God sends it's one of the ways he's going to cause you to prosper so if he gives you a witty idea or an invention I challenge you to write it down because when I leave a lot of people get them some people are already having things invented that they got when God dropped it down and because I'm going to take a few few more minutes there's a place in heaven called the idea zone because God names everything and guess what that is? That's the place where the witty ideas and inventions come from. And it looks like this beautiful glory cloud on the streets of gold, about three or four feet off the street. People run into it and get ideas. They go into Creation Lab and invent them. Say, that's cool. They take a wave, just like the ocean wave, a wave off of the idea zone, and they send it around the world. And all those ideas look like little pieces of glitter. If you, if you were in heaven, you looked in the idea zone, you see all these little pieces of glitter moving like waves. And every one of those is an idea or an invention. And he told me, this is how we send them down. It says, everybody say, all the witties and ideas come from heaven. This is how you get them. He sends a wave of that around the earth and drops them like seeds into the mind of man until several people get those ideas. And then they wait a while and then send them back and send more. But he said, I saved some, and I'm only going to send those waves through the homes of my kids. So I would challenge everybody, even kids, get your little notebook from Walmart and write on it witty ideas and inventions because even kids will invent things. You'd be surprised what God can drop in their heart. And you may not understand all of it, but if you see it, draw it the best you can. Write it down if you actually kind of were told what it was. And, and then just wait for God's going to make it possible. One of the things that will be different in this time is that the body of Christ will be getting the ideas and inventions. The finances will be made available for you to create those things. Amen? It's going to be a different time on the earth that's never been here before. Like he said, you cannot take any past revival and gauge what happened there by what, what he's going to do now. And he's going to send things to the marketplace. That means the business world is going to be one of the ways that he's going to take the gospel and these ideas and inventions into the marketplace because people need things. And he's going to say, why shouldn't they buy them from my kids? Amen. Say, thank you, Father, thank you, Father. for letting me be a part. Amen. And God, right now I ask you to bless everybody here. Father, just bless them lying down and rising up. Bless them in their relationships. Bless them in their businesses. If they don't have a job and need a job, make a job available. I thank you for those who have jobs. Increase the money they're making. Even while the world is reducing it, God, we don't go by their economy. We go by your economy. So I thank you, God, for showing your hands strong on behalf of them, Father. If they don't have a home, give them a home in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, that you're about to take people and put them up where the world can see them because they've been living righteously, they've been giving, they've been loving, they've been faithful even under attack, God. You're going to use a lot of the unknown people in these last days to do great things for you. And everybody said, Amen. If you possibly can, make sure you come back tomorrow. You don't want to miss that message on the third day. Amen. And uh, I think that my husband, where is he? Uh, Going to be out by the products table. I might be out there in a minute to sign some stuff if you want me to. And thank you so much for coming and, and God bless you all. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand.